And um, I see we have uh, almost a couple hundred participants joining. And uh, as I'm talking here, I'm watching the participant numbers go up. But, um, but I, I know we have a lot to cover today. And uh, so first of all, I want to thank everybody who's here for uh, attending uh, LPA's uh, first national Cognos virtual user group meeting. Under uh, normal conditions, um, I'm not sure what, if we'll ever be back to what we used to call normal, but under normal conditions, LPA hosts uh, Cognos user group meetings all around the country. Uh, in fact, we had one in Dallas, Texas, just, just two um, very, very long months ago uh, on February 27th uh, that I was able to attend. And I believe that was our last in-person event uh, like this that took place. And I believe that was uh, end of February, early March was probably the last in-person event that many of us attended. Today, just so you know, we have over 350 participants registered for this event. Uh, they come from 35 different states and 20 different countries around the world. Yes, really, 20 different countries um, from as far away as Japan, India, Switzerland, Poland, Uruguay, uh, Argentina, Belarus, others. Um, I was thinking that perhaps we should have renamed this the first ever international Cognos user group meeting. So I'm not sure one that's, one's been done like that. Um, and again, there's going to be a lot of new normals in the world. Uh, many of the international participants are from client companies that LPA already does business with here in the U.S., and they're an extended part of the team. Others just find LPA on the web and decide to come, um, come to our free training. Uh, we do a lot of events. Almost every other week we put out a webinar um, that is uh, available to the public um, that provides training on IBM analytics topics. So, Again, thank you all for spending some of your valuable time with us. Um, I'm going to review the logistics for today's event. Uh, please bear with us uh, if we have any technical glitches. Um, we're coordinating six different top-notch speakers on different topics, uh, and they're all in different locations, so we got to hand off and so forth. But we also want to uh, provide you, the audience, uh, a chance to have an interactivity um, with us. And so we're going to have a Q&A section um, in, the, in the dialogue boxes that you can ask questions. I'll monitor questions, and we're going to leave time um, for as much interactivity as we can uh, provide. Okay, so let's get started. First is the obligatory who is LPA overview. I'm going to make this quick because many of you already know it, but uh, some of you are, are new. Um, so I have just a couple slides here. And um, let me get started. The profile of LPA is that we were founded in 2001, so we're almost a 20-year-old company. We're headquartered in Rochester, New York, but we have consultants all throughout the United States. Essentially, what we do is implement and resell IBM Analytics products. That's, that's kind of who we are. That's what we do. Um, we are an IBM Platinum Analytics Partner. Our, all of our consultants are uh, certified up to the latest certification. We also are an IBM Services Partner, so sometimes IBM will subcontract us to implement projects on their behalf. We've done over 100 projects where we've implemented IBM technology in third-party applications, embedding Cognos or other IBM technologies into uh, some of our own clients. Um, presentation. So um, we have 400 plus clients um, around the world and uh, our experience, uh, on my next chart, let me just go to the next chart because this is uh, more interesting. We, um, it's starting the top right, business intelligence, right, Cognos, uh, that's why a uh, majority of the folks are on the, the meeting today. I've highlighted in yellow four areas we're going to cover. Uh, information around migration and uh, upgrades, embedded analytics, training. Um, let me just click on, try and get this in slideshow mode. Oh, first technical glitch. Um, I'm just going to keep running with it um, in this mode. 
Um, bottom right, information management and data warehousing. Uh, we have skills in data warehousing, ETL. Now, our skills in ETL span Microsoft SSIS, Informatica, IBM Data Stage. Any of our analytics projects must be implemented pulling data from somewhere. So we have uh, diverse skills in the information management uh, and data warehousing space. We're not really talking about that today, but be aware we have those skills. On the bottom, financial and operational analytics. Today, in particular, we're going to talk about planning analytics using for HR planning. Um, so Brendan Austin will be presenting on that. I think you'll find that very interesting. And then the top left, uh, advanced analytics and AI. Um, we, LTA does a lot in this space. You can see different logos. There's a weather company. We, we have done projects bringing weather data in to help do predictive analytics projects. Um, in particular today, we're going to hit on two topics towards the end of the day. Our Chief Technology Officer will talk about using uh, AI machine learning for visual inspection and um, also virtual assistant. So we have all these specialties, and in the middle it says analytics strategy and roadmap. So we can provide our clients uh, a strategy to think through where you are today on your analytics journey and where you want to get to. What are your key business goals? And we go through a, a methodical process of identifying, prioritizing, and then laying out a plan for you. Uh, we've done this with several clients, and it's worked um, very well, and uh, the, it's really kind of codified their analytics roadmap. Um, so that's who LPA is and what we do. Um, you can see from this chart, we have clients in every industry, whether you're in financial services or insurance or education or energy or uh, manufacturing. So our clients, uh, our hundreds of clients span every industry. Um, and I did mention uh, briefly, we do a lot of training. Today, April 29th, we're doing this event. So on May 4th, May 11th, May 18th, we have virtual training, actually full day training classes that we're providing that you could sign up for and use a credit card to, to pay for. Uh, that's formal training. We also do all these uh, webinars and other events. And you can see later in the month, uh, we have a webinar on what's new in planning analytics. And so we have a lot of these events. If you go to our website, uh, and it's very easy to remember, www.lpa.com, we have an events page so where you can sign up for future events. And you could also go and look at the um, webinars that were previously run, so you can listen to past events. So a lot of good stuff there. Um, with that, our agenda for today, I'm not going to read all this to you, um, but we're getting started with what's new in Cognos version 11.1.6. We're going to transfer over then to Jupyter Notebooks integration with Cognos Analytics. Then we're going to move into a topic on improving report performance using data modules and data sets, very popular functions in Cognos today. So that's first from uh, as soon as I finish here in a couple minutes, uh, right through about 245, where is Cognos heavy. We're going to then cover a topic on Modio, which is a tool set. If you're not familiar with, I think you'll find this very useful. And you can see all these um, uh, sections we're doing are 20 to 30 minute sections. So, um, you know, if you're not particularly focused on one section, uh, you know, wait a little bit and you, uh, you'll see the next section that we believe will be of high value. And then um, after that, we have a topic on planning analytics, as I mentioned, uh, around HR. Uh, we have a topic on what is IBM Cloud Pack for data, which I think everybody should uh, pay attention to. This is uh, IBM's future architecture. Um, well, present and future architecture that will permeate um, their analytics product, product. And then we're going to have this uh, last section, what is all this hype about AI and machine learning anyway? We're going to, David Russell, our CTO, will give you two very, very specific cases uh, that you can implement quickly and easily, uh, well, easily may be an overstatement, but um, it's, it's a good topic. Um, our last topic, uh, 4 o'clock, hopefully we'll stay to our schedule, is uh, going to be an Ask the Experts. Any questions that we don't get to answer during each section, we will um, attempt to answer in this last section. So with that, so just some very simple logistics. Um, 
This meeting is being recorded. Um, everybody should be aware of that. The recording has already started. The presentations from today will be available on our website. During the presentations, uh, please submit questions via the Q&A box that should be on the bottom right of your screen um, as part of the WebEx. I will uh, monitor questions and at the end of each presentation, uh, leave some time for the speakers to answer some questions. Um, the unanswered ones, again, we'll handle it uh, hopefully at 4 p.m. in the virtual happy hour. Um, the other thing is I'm going to start a poll here uh, in a moment, um, which should be up on the bottom right of your screen as well. And if you can, um, uh, please answer the questions on the poll. And if, when you answer them, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll collate all that data, and then at the end of the day, we're going to, um, you know, present that, uh, the results of the poll. So um, with that, um, oh, one last thing that I'm required to do in any of these events, you know, the emergency exits are wherever your emergency exits are, and the restrooms are wherever your restrooms are. So everybody's got their own, uh, their own uh, spot for those things. With that, I'm going to pause the screen here um, and uh, make an attempt here to uh, pass the ball to our first presenter. Um, which will be uh, Mr. Rich Chester. And um, as soon as I can get my first technical glitch handled here, participants, here we go. Host handing to Rich Chester. Okay, Rich, you should be uh, getting control here, um, and I believe. Thank you, Don. I have. And uh, if you can hear me, then I'm unmuted. I can hear you, so hopefully you're unmuted and um, balls in your court. Thank you so much. Hey, welcome everybody. Good day. Uh, I'm Rich Chester. I uh, direct the business intelligence practice at LPA. What that means is I'm accountable for the success of all of our projects. That's the success of our consultants as they deliver services and the success of our clients in terms of leveraging the Cognos Analytics product, which is our biggest uh, focus area in the business intelligence practice. Uh, my goal today is to give you an introduction to the latest and greatest release of Cognos Analytics, which is uh, known as R6. Uh, technically, the version is 11.1.6. I will uh, give you some slides. I'm not going to spend a lot of time reading the slides, and do keep in mind, my friends, you will get the slides if you want after the webinar, so you don't have to take a bunch of screenshots if you don't want to. Um, my goal is to spend a little bit of time uh, on the slides, but a little bit more time, hopefully demonstrating some of the new features. Uh, I only have 30 minutes, so we may run out of time for demos, um, but uh, you know, we'll, we'll go with what we've got. When you log into R6 after upgrading to it or installing it, you're gonna find that the look and feel has changed. And that's because IBM is focused now on having a consistent look and feel across all of their products. And they have this notion called carbon design. This is a, uh, a foundation system for the development of applications. And part of carbon design, uh, and uh, this is an open source uh, project that IBM has sponsored and, and, uh, and created, but it's now complete open source. The website's on the page. But the idea there is, according to this carbon design system and the principles there, um, look and feel across all the products is critical um, from a consistency perspective. So all new icons for your Cognos Analytics pleasure. The other overall thing that you'll notice has changed in Cognos is the uh, help feature has been beefed up uh, significantly. Um, there's an awful lot of help out there on the web. There's uh, blogs and uh, manuals. There's a whole community. There's the, uh, uh, the IBM Knowledge Center. But really, they've never been organized in any one place to give you quick access. That was the goal with the new help panel. You click the help button in the top right of the screen, and you now have a very highly organized access to all of the IBM help assets that are available out there. So two sort of big overall changes there. 
Now, I'm going to try to go feature by feature within the, the different tools. In dashboards and stories, one of the big changes is that the toolbar is now docked at the top of the screen. You might remember that in a previous release, the report toolbar was dockable at the top of the report writing interface, and you could undock it if you wish. Now the same is true of dashboards and stories. The toolbar defaults to being docked at the top of the screen. There is a button for you to undock it so that it will move to each widget as you click it on your canvas if you wish. In addition to the docking of the toolbar, You'll also notice that on the right hand side of that same portion directly under the application bar is yet another toolbar. Um, and that's shown here in the bottom screenshot where your uh, widget connections and your full screen mode now lives on um, the no longer on the blue application bar plus your properties button. A new thing called fields, which we'll get to in a second, and then this filters button. The filters button's job is to show and hide the filter docs at the top of the dashboard interface. Um, just, uh, it's now labeled uh, and it's not a carrot pointing up and down for expand and collapse. Properties are properties, they've been there all along. Fields is new. This fields pane is the data slots for a visualization. So in previous releases, to get to the data slots for a visualization, you selected the visualization you clicked on the expand button in the top right corner, and then you could modify the data slots. Let's call that clumsy. It worked, it, it certainly got the job done, but it was clumsy. What IBM has done is they've moved all the data slots to a panel now on the right-hand side, effectively making them another property sheet as opposed to hidden behind this expanded view. So it's all the same stuff, it's all the same slots. Uh, it's just a much easier access to the data slots. So what happened to that button in the corner, that expand button? They changed the definition. It's no longer expand to leverage my data slots. It's now take my selected visualization and make it full screen. So this allows me to look uh, at the details of a visualization regardless of its size by simply clicking on it. And this works either in view mode when you're consuming a dashboard or in edit mode when you're creating or modifying a dashboard. When you click the expand button now, its sole job is to maximize the widget. You expand it, you leverage that widget to your heart's content, then you click the collapse button so that it will jump back to the original size. Okay, so some UI changes. One of the themes in dashboards enhancements over the past few releases has been to enhance crosstabs in dashboards. Um, in previous releases, uh, give you enhancements like uh, being able to hide rows, being able to uh, change the width of columns and that sort of thing. In this release, there's a couple of more enhancements. The first one, uh, relative to using cube type data sources, this could be DMR, it's not technically a cube, but it's OLAP, it could be TM1, or planning analytics, it could be a power cube, it could be a dynamic cube, it could be analysis services. Regardless of the cube technology, when you create a cross tab using the levels in your hierarchies, they become expandable within the cross tab. And I'm gonna do a demo of that. So I'm not gonna describe it anymore. I'm just gonna to talk to you about a couple of more features and then I'm gonna jump in and do a demo on the dashboards. Another change, is to be able to add unit labels to your measures if you need to. Uh, perhaps quantity is a measure, but it's not clear from the measure name that quantity is metric tons. And so maybe it's desirable for you to label on a visualization the units, metric tons, each is in the case of my example on the screen. So I'll show you how that looks. Uh, so that's the end of the dashboard enhancements. I'm gonna switch over therefore to Cognos Analytics R6. So this is the new interface. You'll notice the new icons. <clears throat> You'll see them throughout. That help feature that I was talking about is over here. And I have out in my content uh, a dashboard that I'm gonna start with that will get us going with some of the new features and the new user interface. Um, so I've opened it and I'm in view mode. I'm gonna switch to edit mode. I will dismiss my what's new just to get it out of the way. So there's my filter docs, right? My filters button expands and collapse my filter docs. My fields button exposes the fields panel. And when I select a visualization, 
such as this one, you'll notice that my fields are visible and changeable. Um, just like the old expand mode, the expand button now is the focus mode button. And the focus mode button simply maximizes the visualization, and then you can collapse it. This data source for my dashboard is a, uh, um, a DMR uh, package, the old Go Sales Analysis package. And what I did is I created this uh, cross tab by dragging the year level over from my time dimension and dragging the product line level over from my products dimension. And simply by doing that and nothing more, you'll note that my product lines and my years are expandable. So I can select to expand camping equipment, which will show me all of the product types, which is the next level down, for camping equipment. Then if I expanded, say, cooking gear, you'll note that I have my, uh, my cooking gear products listed, because that's the next level down. So this is in lieu of drilling up and down. Remember, when you drill up and down, you replace the entire axis. When you expand, the axis remains the same, but you see the children of the item you expanded. And you could do that on the other uh, axis as well. So I could expand 2011 and the next level down would be uh, quarters. I can collapse after I've expanded. So that's the expand and collapse feature for cross tabs relative to the new feature. Now, also in cross tabs is this notion, maybe I want to label units. So this cross tab is showing quantities. My quantities happen to be metric tons. Nowhere on the screen is that obvious. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select my widget, and over here in the fields panel, I'm going to open my more button here and the values for quantity, and I'm going to choose format. When I do that, you'll notice that it's formatted as a number, and one of the items that I can add is the label, the units label. So I'm going to type a space MT. The label position you can set to beginning or end. The default happens to be end you'll notice immediately everything is now labeled with my units. So that's another enhancement. And then the final enhancement I'll show you here that I'm not even sure I mentioned on the slide is what about missing values. So you'll notice this no value legend is the indicator that that cell is null. There's no data present in my data source for 2010 mountaineering equipment. Perhaps this no value default is not what you'd like. You'd like to change that. Um, you can simply right click in the intersections of the cross tab and on the pop up toolbar there's a format button which you can press. And if you go to the text portion of that format, you can change from that no value to anything you like. Like NA. Or some folks might want to put a zero MT um, rather than having it blank they want to show zero. Other folks, maybe just two minuses, whatever you want, you now have the opportunity to put. So those are some of the dashboard changes, the new fields, the updates to my cross tab capabilities, um, the docked toolbar up here. Um, if I undock it, you'll note that it goes back to where it was in previous releases, which is typically along the side. Um, and if you undocked it and you wish to redock it, you can go right ahead. So those are the dashboard enhancements. So much to get to, so little time. I'm going to uh, jump back into the presentation and chat with you now about the AI Assistant. A couple of enhancements in the AI Assistant. Um, guided dashboard creation and personalized recommendations. Guided dashboard creation really takes what used to be a two-step process and turns it into a one-step process. Um, you used to be able to do guided dashboard creation, but you had to first ask a question. Show me revenue by product line and then you would get a suggested chart. And then under the chart, there was a link that said create dashboard from chart, two steps. Now all you say is create a dashboard and you tell it the type of dashboard you wanna do. The other item is called personalized recommendations. This gets into the notion of the assistant learns as you go. When you ask it to do things and then you react to the results that the assistant has uh, presented, like show me a chart that displays this. You get a collection of charts. You select the word cloud more often than not. Cognos remembers that. And the next time it presents 
a collection of chart options where word cloud is reasonable, it'll move word cloud towards the beginning of the selection of charts, knowing that that's your propensity, that's your preferred chart, so why not display it first? Now that learning is going on behind the scenes, and before now you didn't have a way to impact that. Now you do. First of all, your administrator can use this new capability called AI learning to enable learning for groups of folks, or I suppose you could also say disable learning for groups of folks using groups and roles in the security section of Cognos. The other thing is that I, as an end user, have a personal menu, and on there I have preferences. And in the preferences area, um, I have a new entry under advanced that allows me to turn off the learning so that the AI is not learning things about me, and also allows me to reset any learning that's been stored. So let me show you some examples of these. So first of all, I'll just show you in the personal preferences where the under advanced, under personal, under AI learning, you can manage. And here's where you can say, I don't want to learn you to learn about me and, and delete what you know about me. That's the control that end users have out under manage and people and capabilities. You will find the AI capability and that um, learning subcategory here. So this is how you would assign the learning to groups or roles of folks. So I just wanted to show you that quickly. Let me show you this guided dashboard thing. I'm going to bring up a, what is effectively an empty um, dashboard. The only thing that it has in it really is a data source. Just so I wanted to start quickly with a data source. It's a simple little data source that comes from a data module that I loaded up. I'm going to open the assistant. The assistant uh, asks, how can I help you? And I'm going to use this um, uh, guided dashboard creation. I'm just going to say create dashboard for top 10 products by gross profit and hit enter. It's going to think for a minute if it can indeed do that. It thinks it can because it told me OK. And so it has created a dashboard for me. So Create Dashboard has been around for a number of releases. It started out very rudimentary, basically Create Dashboard. And it applied advanced analytics and typically gave you a tab per measure in your data source. Um, it got a bit more uh, sophisticated with the uh, guided dashboard creation in two steps. And now we have even more sophistication with the guided gap dashboard creation in a single step. So that's the enhancements in the assistant. And I know I'm going fast and I apologize, but we're, we're trying to, to do a lot today. Um, the next collection of enhancements is in the world of explorations. So in the past, when you use the data set for explorations or indeed in a dashboard on any of the advanced analytic visualizations, you couldn't use standalone calculations. Uh, so you could, you could use measures, you could use non-measures as targets in the decisions tree in the spiral in the relationship diagram uh, in the exploration tool, but you couldn't use standalone calcs, now you can. So that's uh, just additional flexibility in the kinds of targets that you can specify in those advanced analytic visualizations. And the other enhancement is that you're going to get some additional details whenever the exploration tool detects that you are charting a time series. And it's gonna examine the time series, and if it can derive a forecasting model, whether you actually just expose the forecasting model or not doesn't matter for this particular enhancement. If it can derive a forecasting model behind the scenes, then over in the details panel on the right-hand side of the exploration page, you're going to see some details. You're going to see information of perhaps three different types. Trends, it's trending up strongly, it's trending up mildly, it's trending down strongly, whatever. Um, unusual values. Hey, on this point in time, you had an unusually high or an unusually low value overall, and or seasonal effects. Um, hey, you seem to have a very strong quarterly seasonal effect or annual effect right around this date or these months. So these are additional insights that are new in R6 and they're specific to the exploration tool when a time series is charted and a forecasting model is derived.
mapping has been enhanced. The, the couple of enhancements on mapping are, are really quite um, 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 impressive, I think. The first is that um, in those maps that are the partnership between IBM, Mapbox, and Pitney Bowes, in those maps, in the visualizations, and this is true in both dashboards and reports, uh, heretofore you could only color regions and points by measures, numeric data. Um, what's changed now is I can use non-measures or so-called categorical values to color a map. Um, and I can do that in regions for like states and cities and zips. I could also do that for points. And indeed, I could even do that for coordinated uh, coordinates, latitudes and longitudes. So I'll do a quick example of that. Additionally, um, air handling has been enhanced uh, two two big ways. One, used to be if you were plotting latitude, longitude, and Cognos didn't understand the coordinate, it would plot your data at coordinate zero, zero. Now it doesn't plot the data at all. It simply presents you with a, a message that says, I can't plot this. It doesn't artificially plot your latitude, longitude. Secondly, the messages that you get for unrecognized locations, whether they're uh, zip codes or states or coordinates or what have you, um, the information has been enhanced, especially when the omitted values, the values that it couldn't plot, contain significantly different values than the ones it plotted. Uh, IBM refers to this as if the domain of the map changed by omitting the values, then it's going to tell you in the message. So you see up here at the top, the two of the data points that have been removed from the map have values that are greater than the, the maximum value shown for the ones I could plot. So this gives you a notion that not only did you have regions that couldn't be plotted, they constituted a very large amount of your data in total. And so you'll get that additional insight that you lost a lot of data by losing those points. So of course, fix, right? So that you won't lose that data is the notion. So with those two said, relative to mapping, I'm going to go into my, my content and I have a starter report that I'm going to edit. And in this report, I've added a map visualization from the 11.1 library. I've just got a very quick little data module that I'm using that highlights weather events. And in previous releases, any of these measures could have been gone, uh, placed in this location color that would have worked fine, it still does. The new thing, and I'll go into preview as we do this, uh, is that I can take non-measures like event type and drop them in to location color. And now you see my states, because that's what I'm plotting. Our states are now colored by the distinct values of event type. Now, certain states could have more than one event, right? So this warning down here is telling me that there were states that had more than one event, and I can only show one color. So I'm showing one of the event colors in the states. Um, the point layer uh, can use the events as well. The interesting thing about the point layer that I really like, oops, uh, let's see. I wonder why it won't let me do that. Let me try that here. So the problem with live demos, right? Um, sometimes they, they go awry. All right, well, this time they went awry. What's it doing to, to color the, the, the point? Well, it's, see, it's using, again, the event. When I, I showed you the slide, and let me go back to the slide quickly just so you can see it there since it's not cooperating with me. Did you notice that the size of the point here um, is actually concentric rings? Well, see, when you size by a categorical value, it counts the values for each category and plots a circle for each of those counts. So unlike I get one color when I color the state, I get concentric rings in my points, a ring for each event type in my example, and the count of the event type controls the size of the ring. So it would have been very cool if I could have demoed that, but at least you see it on the slide. Um, and uh, again, rather than troubleshoot, uh, we're just going to move on together. So that is um, the, the mapping enhancement that I talked about in the slide. Uh, let's see, I've only got a few more minutes here. Notebooks have been enhanced heretofore. 
Jupyter Notebooks only worked with Python. Um, as of 11.1.6, you could also work with R if you wish. You just change your kernel to the, the kernel that makes you happy, and you can use either programming language in your notebooks. You're going to get into notebooks in the next section with Mohammed, so I'm not going to spend any time there now. Reporting has been enhanced. Uh, a new data container. Uh, this data container is called a data list. The, it's like a table. Um, pardon me, that's a, that's a dashboard term. It's like a list in a crosstab. Um, however, a data table is not rendered on the Cognos server like lists are. Instead, when you run the report, it renders this list, this data table, on the user's browser, making the interactions with the list super, super quick. Kinds of interactions would be uh, interacting with filters, expanding and collapsing groups, uh, sorting things. Those happen on the user's browser. Therefore, they're very, very quick. Now, keep in mind that when you use the data tables container, it's only supported in HTML, right? Because the whole point of that is to facilitate these interactions. PDF and Excel are not considered interactive output types. So this data container would not work with those output types. It's HTML only. If we have time, um, I, I could give you a demo of this, but I'm not sure we're going to have time. Also in reporting, in the 11.1 visualization world, the bars and columns now support multiple measures in the length data slot. Used to be I could only plot one measure in a bar or column chart. Now I can plot as many as I wish. And there's this measures from length object that gets added so that it will give you a palette, a color, for each measure, and then of course you can control the palette like you would any other palette in a visualization. So that's new in R6. You can also drill up and drill down on 11.1 visualizations now. Uh, that was not supported in previous releases. Now it's supported in 11.1 visualization library. Of course, you have to be using an OLAP data source for that to work. Data modules have been enhanced in a significant way. The most significant is a quick and easy way to know when you're looking at your sources which tables and columns are and are not in use already in your module. Okay, so you see you can turn on a show unused items and you'll get highlights on all of the unused objects, whether that's a whole table that's unused or it's columns in a table like I'm showing here. Going along with that is the ability to add an individual column to your data module. So used to be you had to re-add the whole table and then again, delete what you didn't want. Now, if I want unit price in my module, I simply click on unit price and drag it in. I no longer have to drag the entire table and therefore all of the missing columns in, and then delete the ones I didn't want um, again. So that's a, uh, you know, goes hand in hand with this what's unused. Um, and also, if you're using a data server, when you know that the metadata has changed, somebody's added a new table, modified uh, a table that you're using with new columns that you need, used to be your administrator had to go in and load the metadata for you on the data server, then you could use it. Now, there is a way within the interface for you to load that metadata right from within the data module tool. So a couple of good enhancements in data modules. There is a new command line utility and framework manager as part of R6 whose job in life is to change the case of the objects in your model, either all to upper or all to lower. Um, when I read about this, I, I looked for the why was this an important utility to add. And apparently, um, as you move your model from database to database, let's suppose you migrate from database one to database two, it's got all the same tables, but now database two, maybe it's case sensitive. And so you need to change the case in your model to match the case in the database, and so this utility will do that for you. Two administration things, and then I have, will have completed my, my collection of slides, and maybe there'll be a, uh, answer and, uh, question and answer time. Um, Watson Knowledge Catalog is a, a separately licensed tool from IBM, grossly oversimplified. It is a central way to manage all of your data source connections, as well as control the governance uh, and collaboration across those data sources. Cognos can now leverage those definitions in data servers. So you don't have to also type them into Cognos. You can point to Watson Knowledge Catalog and you'll inherit the definition that's there. And finally, there's been a license update in 11.1. Um, 
The license update is this. The exploration tool used to be limited to users leveraging an analytics explorer license. IBM has changed the entitlements for the licenses and now the exploration tool is available to all of the people who are using an analytics user license in your environment. So they've moved it to a wider audience within your organization. So if you've been avoiding rolling out explorations because of the license requirement for an analytic explorer, this should be good news for you. And with that, I am going to turn it back over to Don. Um, and maybe Don, if there's some questions that you would like to uh, answer or have me answer, uh, you, could, you could answer them too, I guess. Uh, that would be great. Yeah, Rich, um, four questions came in uh, during your presentation. Um, I, what I'm gonna do is, uh, I'm probably gonna ask you two of them to try and keep us on track and we'll, we'll save the other two for a little bit later. Um, so question number one, um, is there a way to change the no value content to an empty column if using strings or just a plain zero if using numbers? This came in early in your presentation. So actually, I think um, one of the enhancements does cover that. So if you right click and use the data format tool in a cross tab, that no value legend can be changed to whatever you type in. So you could type in a blank and then it would be empty. You could type in a zero. You could type in an alternate text. So uh, yes, with R6, you have that option. Okay. Uh, second question, is expanding and collapsing hierarchies in cross tabs available in reports or only in dashboards slash stories? At this time, it is a dashboard stories enhancement. Um, the, uh, it, many, many times they start out in dashboards and then in a subsequent release, they get added to reports. So I wouldn't close the door on that in a future release, but right now it's dashboards and stories. Okay, and like I said, there are two more questions, but um, we're already five minutes over, um, which was my five minutes over at the beginning. So I kept you on, on track, Rich. Um, and I'll save the last two questions. Uh, so the, the last two folks that ask questions, you gotta hang around for the happy hour to hear Rich's answers. Um, right, in the meantime, I'm passing the uh, thank you. I'm passing the ball to uh, Mohammed, uh, who is going to talk to us about Jupyter Notebook. Um, and just for all the presenters, I'm going to pass the ball um, from presenter to presenter, rather than you guys passing it back to me just to show the agenda chart. Um, so I'm going to pass it to Mohammed and let Mohammed uh, share his screen and uh, introduce himself. And uh, one of the comments I want to make while he's getting set up here is um, Rich Chester, uh, and again, uh, we have a mix of folks, uh, participants. Just, just so you guys know, there are over 250 people on this, uh, uh, on this user group meeting now. Uh, so I'm very excited on the, uh, the percentage of folks that registered that are attending. Um, Rich Chester and uh, Muhammad Yaga, who are presenting, as it will be Chris and David, are all folks that are consultants that come out and do training on site um, and also, <laughs> obviously, uh, much more in today's world, uh, remotely. Um, we were doing remote training prior to uh, the whole uh, COVID crisis, and now we're doing much more of it. Uh, without further ado, Muhammad, the ball's in your court. I'm going to turn my video off while you're the star of the show here. Thanks, Mohammed. Thank you, Don. And uh, can you please confirm if you can all hear me and you're seeing my slides, right? Yes, I can see your slides and I can hear you, Mohammed. Perfect. All right. Uh, good day, everyone. Uh, my name is Mohammed Yahya, and I'm a principal business analytics consultant with LPA Software Solutions. And as Don already says, uh, I do everything related to Cognos Analytics uh, from advisory services to installations, design and developing dashboards, models, uh, and training. Right, and today I'm really excited to talk about how Jupyter Notebook integrates with uh, Cognos Analytics and basically transforms this whole tool from a basic reporting and dashboarding tool to an actually uh, a, a data platform, right? Uh, where you can utilize uh, Cognos not only for your reporting and dashboarding needs, 
actually you I mean the whole uh, advanced analytics is now open. You're able to do machine learning, deep learning, sentiment analysis, and all of those. So with that being said, uh, let's talk about what is Jupyter Notebook. So I understand that we have about uh, 300, 350 people uh, joined. So we have all spectrum of people uh, joined in. So let's talk about what is Jupyter Notebook. Jupyter Notebook is basically a web-based platform that lets you write uh, your Python or R code, right? It's as simple as that. And with that, you are you will be able to do your uh, data analysis, your predictive modeling. You'll be able to create visualizations, and essentially, all the buzzwords nowadays you see related to uh, like machine learning, deep learning, uh, fraud detection, customer churn. All of those things are now possible uh, with this Jupyter notebook. Uh, IBM introduced it first in 11.1.2. So if you are uh, currently on Cognos Analytics 11.1.2, you are already entitled to Jupyter Notebooks, and we can definitely help you set that up. Or if you are uh, in a, on an older version, you can uh, upgrade it to uh, the latest release, which is 11.1.6. Uh, that just got released a couple of days back. And with 11.1.6, now you also have support for R. So if you have a data scientist who are proficient in, in R language, now uh, that kernel is available in Jupyter Notebook as well in, in Cognos. Uh, and again, uh, this Jupyter Notebook server uh, for Cognos, that by default comes with all the library, libraries and packages you have uh, in Anaconda and Pixie Dust. So basically, I mean, all those NumPy, Pandas, uh, Flask, all those uh, uh, libraries that data scientists uh, use uh, day in and day out are available in this package by default. So how do Jupyter Notebook apply to data science, right? So as a standard flow, uh, whenever or whoever is doing data science, the, the mechanism they use is basically they, they start with exploring the data, right? They want to find out how my fields are related to each other, uh, what is the correlation, what fields or what features are uh, giving me better prediction than the other, things like that. And once you are done with that analysis, you start creating your model, and then on that model, you do predictions, and then you do some accuracy testing in terms of uh, how accurate that model is, whether it is 10% accurate or 90% accurate, right? So that's the overflow, that, that's the, the, the general flow of data science, right? And Jupyter Notebook makes it really simple to implement that for, for data scientists, right? It, it's, a, it's a simple tool that lets you write a code in a very conversational manner where you are writing a code and looking at the output, right? And then basically just analyzing that code over and over again, right? You, you, you write some code, you see what the result is. If you like it, you move on. Otherwise, you write the next code and move on. And basically the cycle repeats. So that's how Jupyter Notebook work, and it makes it really simple and easy for a data scientist to uh, apply or, or work uh, in that uh, environment, right? So why do we use Jupyter Notebook inside Cognos? So as I said, right, when IBM introduced uh, Jupyter Notebook and integrated it with Cognos, it basically transformed the whole uh, tool uh, from simple reporting and dashboarding tool to a data platform, right? In many organizations, we see today that, I mean, data scientists, they are using ungoverned data. I mean, each one has uh, their own truth. No one is following a single source of truth type thing, right? And Cognos is that platform that basically is a go-to uh, platform or go-to tool set for business to go and look for reports and dashboard and basically uh, get to a governed set of data, right? And combining these two, right, uh, Jupyter Notebook capabilities and uh, the functionalities we get from Cognos Analytics, basically we are, it, it's, it's a perfect combination, right? You are getting all the good things from Cognos Analytics plus the power of Jupyter Notebook as well. So when 
you use them together, uh, you are able to basically share data uh, with other scientists. So, for example, uh, whoever is familiar with Cognos Analytics, you know that you can you can share reports and dashboards with other users, right? Similar thing applies concept here that you are able to share uh, your notebook with other developers, other users. You they are able to simply view that, and again, you are leveraging governed data. So with this notebook, you are able to read uh, uploaded files, you are able to read data sets, uh, data modules, and packages. And again, when IBM integrated Cognos into uh, notebook into Cognos, right, they are not just, they, just, they, they did not make it a, a separate portal where you're just reading information from Cognos. They made it part of Cognos where all of your data security, so for example, if you're reading data from a data module or a package, all of your backend joins and unions and what have, whatever modeling you have defined, that is utilize your, uh, your security is utilized not only at the data level, but you can secure your notebooks as well as to who have access to these notebooks, who can view those and things like that, right? And of course, uh, we just talked about that uh, in general, when we are doing data science, you are you're producing some output or some uh, some content, and now you have a capability where you can simply uh, publish that uh, data set into Cognos and create reports and dashboards out of it. So, using Notebook with Cognos gives data scientists a huge leverage in terms of how easy it makes them uh, it makes to to share content, right? As soon as they have uh, uh, some uh, meaningful output ready to share, they'll be able to send this to a larger audience with no problem uh, by creating a nice looking dashboards and reports. And of course, you'll be able to upload your existing uh, notebook. So for example, if you already have data scientists working in your organization and they have the notebooks available, you'll be able to simply upload those uh, notebooks into Cognos and they simply work, right? Uh, the only change you have to do, and again, uh, when we do the demo, I'll show you a few examples where I have just taken notebooks from uh, the, 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 the older uh, non-Cognos notebooks and converted them into Cognos uh, and just switching the, the data source from those Excel files to a Cognos data source, right? So how do you get access to Jupyter Notebook? It's very simple. Uh, it must run on either Linux or uh, Windows 10 box, right? So usually if, if, you're, if you're utilizing Linux for your Cognos Analytics environment, you can install it on your same server, but it is recommended to have a separate uh, box dedicated to Jupyter Notebooks, right? Uh, Windows Server is not available right now because the, we have some uh, discrepancy with Docker because Docker is required in both instances. So it doesn't matter whether you're using uh, Linux or Windows 10, uh, you require to install Docker, right? And installation is very simple. It's basically how you install a standard application server. You have installable executable file you point it to a, a zip repository and basically it's a next, next, next. So similar concept applies here. You uh, install, uh, you first install Jupyter Notebook server for Cognos, and then there are a few um, configuration settings you have to do, a few scripts you have to run. And once all that is set and done, uh, all you have to do is, for example, as I'm showing on the screen, in the admin console, you have a new property called uh, Jupyter Server Location. All you have to do is just provide a URL for that server, and Cognos automatically at the back end make the integration work and make Jupyter part of your Cognos uh, environment. So as I said earlier, right, uh, when IBM integrated Jupyter Notebook into Cognos, they did a really nice job of making Jupyter Notebook part of Cognos as an object, right? Which means that all of your security is applied. You have uh, access control, who gets to uh, use Jupyter Notebook, who can view it, who can run it. Uh, Security-wise, you're able to share it as uh, you normally share your reports and dashboard, uh, 
plus, uh, you run it in background, right? So uh, scheduling is, is a big, a huge plus from Cognos perspective, right? A lot of time we have reports and dashboard that we schedule on a monthly basis or a weekly basis or a daily basis, right? Now you have a capability since IBM have in, integrated notebook into Cognos itself, you have a capability to simply schedule your notebooks and get the output, right? And all the visualizations you are creating in, uh, in your notebook, you can view those visualization or use those visualization to create a report or a dashboard, right? So uh, it's not just that when you're creating uh, visualizations in, uh, in notebook, notebook is the only place where you can see those. You can utilize those visualizations in your reports and dashboards, right? Uh, so, and again, I mean, we'll, we'll see an example of how you can automate uh, processes using uh, Node, right? And uh, of course, we already talked about how you can upload your uh, non-Cognos notebooks into uh, Cognos and simply make it part of uh, your data set. With this uh, Cognos Analytics Jupyter Notebook Server, you get few extra methods. So for example, uh, you have this CA data connector dot read data that lets you read your uploaded files, data sets, data modules, and packages from Cognos. And of course, when you're doing your analysis and you're done with your data set and you wanna publish it out, you can publish it in the Cognos uh, as an uploaded file. And you, of course, have three uh, formats available, right? You can create a file, you can override a file, and you can append a file. And this would be uh, an example we'll see. So some use cases, and again, I mean, this is uh, these use cases that I have on the screen, right? I mean, creating visualizations, sophisticated analytics, uh, doing basic ETLs, like, I mean, and all of those like automation, this is just is barely scratching the surface, right? I mean, consider that you are writing Python code inside Cognos with your enterprise data on top of your enterprise data. So imagine the possibilities you have, right? If you have a library available in Python, if you have a business case available that you want to implement, you can now implement that business concept in Cognos, right? Uh, it's that simple, right? And it's that powerful. Right, so it's, it's amazing. Uh, so again, uh, let's take a look at a quick demo and see uh, the power of this thing. So the first demo I wanna show you quickly is, uh, is how you can automate your Excel. So we all have, I mean, even in my current uh, uh, client, we have these scenarios where uh, they have Excel files that they need to upload on, on a weekly or a monthly basis, right? And right now that's, uh, that's a manual process. Somebody have to upload those files. So even though consuming your Excel files or external data is, is, is a lot easier and simple in Cognos, even then refreshing the data is a, is a manual process, right? And this integration makes it uh, amazing, right? Uh, you can simply automate this uh, process. And so, for example, if you know that your data upload uh, updates on a nightly basis or a weekly basis, you can simply run this, schedule this notebook to run on a, on a nightly basis or a monthly basis, and you get fresh data without any human involvement. Right? So again, this is this is a notebook. This is a Jupyter notebook example where. I'm simply importing the, the libraries I need to import. I have this Excel file uh, at a portal uh, that has data. Notice that we have this LPSAD that has 100,000 population. And after reading all of that, we are simply writing it back uh, to my folder. So for example, if I go and show you my folder, I have this population.xls uh, published. So for example, I have created a, a quick dashboard. It's, it's nothing but a, a simple uh, uh, single chart a dashboard where you can see that I have this LPS city that shows 100,000 in, in population, right? I can simply go to uh, this Excel file, right? Open this Excel file and make a change. Uh, 
And for some reason, Excel is taking a long time to open. And that's the, the downside of live, de uh, live demos. <laughs> okay, so while this is loading, so basically, uh, okay, I'm gonna move on and show you basically with that, if I, if I make a change and upload that and run that, it, it basically refreshes that data automatically, right? So this, was, this is my first example where you can simply upload an Excel file and it reads through the data and uh, makes a change, right? The next topic or the next uh, uh, notebook I wanna show you is basically a Titanic uh, survival data set, right? Uh, the reason why I wanna talk about Titanic is anyone who have done, uh, I mean, this is like a, a, a hello world program for data science, right? Anyone who have started data science journey, I mean, this is the, the first topic usually people talk about, right? And again, so this is, a, the, as you can see, this is a huge uh, uh, notebook, right, that I have imported from external source, right? And all I have done after importing is I have changed the reference of from where I'm getting my training set and my test set, right? That's all I have changed, right? So as, I mean, so if any anyone who's, uh, who's a data scientist, right, uh, you can easily see that this is the flow you, you work in, right? You import the libraries you wanna uh, import, you start loading data, you start analyzing your data, right? What data you have, how many records you have. So we can clearly see that for training set, we have 891 records. For uh, test set, we have 418 uh, records, things like that. We can basically simply visualize that data graphically to see, okay, uh, how is my distribution of survival? How many people survived? How many people died? Uh, what's my age distribution for each class and things like that, All right? I don't wanna go into details of what uh, it is, but what I wanna show you is the functionality that, I mean, this notebook, right? Uh, this amazing notebook is inside your Cognos and it is utilizing data set from Cognos, right? Which means uh, the enterprise level data set you have available, you can start working and analyzing that data inside Cognos now, right? So here they are analyzing uh, what's the survival rate based on the class and things like that. You are basically cleaning up data. So again, I'm gonna just quickly go through this, uh, this, uh, uh, this notebook to just show you exactly how uh, a data scientist analyze and how easy it is to do it in Cognos, right? That's, that's my uh, focus here, right? So here you're looking into survival rate by class, survival rate by genders. Uh, you're looking into passenger class distribution as to uh, survival versus non-survival, things like that. Uh, so again, I mean, whole bunch of analysis in terms of what are my predictive features, uh, what is the co uh, correlation among different features we have available. Uh, later on, we are gonna do some feature engineering. So here we are, we are doing some feature engineering to see that uh, what else we can drive from this data that gives us value in terms of uh, uh, prediction uh, capability, right? And then basically we are starting to, to model this data. We are evaluating different uh, methods, different models, different strategies. Uh, we are looking into uh, different correlations in terms of what is our true positive versus false positives and things like that, right? And what I wanna show you at the end that once we have done all that analysis, so again, I'm gonna move for, forward a little fast here because I realize that I don't have much time left uh, but here, what I wanna highlight is that after I am done with the whole analysis, right, I am publishing this data in Cognos, right? And again, right now my data set only has passenger ID and whether they survived on uh, yes or not. But imagine from your scenario, I mean, fraud detection, customer churn, uh, uh, sentiment analysis, right? You name it. Uh, I mean, now you have a capability to do that analysis and publish that results set, do dashboards and reporting, and, and it, it's gonna make data analysis and finding issues in the data or uh, business or finding insights, it's gonna be a lot easier uh, with this tool, 
right? Another example, a quick one I want to show you is, is how you can use uh, notebooks to create uh, visualizations that, for example, are not available. So, for example, this whole dashboard is is an IBM uh, demo dashboard that is built using Jupyter Notebook, right? So you have different information, different charts from like revenue, quantity. I mean, all of this data, all of these charts are coming from Jupyter Notebook. Uh, and basically, you can simply refresh or schedule those visualizations to update uh, on a nightly basis and it do. So for example, uh, quickly want to show you how you can automate or schedule this. So for example, this is my LPA uh, Excel upload automation, right? So you can simply right click on this uh, uh, entity, right? And then sim you can notice that the menu we have, right? You, so you can edit, run. So when you click on run, it runs in the background by default. And it gives you a notification when this entry is uh, available. You have a share capability where you can share it as an email or just give a link to somebody to, to view it. What I want to highlight here is if you go to properties, you have this schedule available here, right? And this schedule is exactly same as what you have available in report. So you would be able to schedule this on a daily basis, weekly, monthly, or by trigger, right? Whatever your business scenario is, you have this uh, capability available uh for for you to consume with that being said uh i would like to wrap up uh and see if uh, don you have any questions uh related to this section yes Mohammed, that was great thank you we we got several questions some of which uh rich chester has been uh, answering in the in the q a block um and i want to remind all participants that if you'd like to ask answer, ask a question, please enter it into the Q&A block. Um, some questions are kind of coming in via a chat block, but um, I'm monitoring the Q&A. So, Mohammed, question number one, and again, I'll do a few of these um, as time allows, and once we don't get to, we'll handle later in the day at four. So, question number one, does Jupyter Notebooks work with Cognos 11.1.x on Windows? I think you may have covered this, but we got several questions around Windows. Um, okay, well, so Windows 10 only. Windows 10 only, yes. So, I mean, right now, uh, the ser uh, Windows Server doesn't work, and IBM is working day and night to make that available, and hopefully soon that would be available. But right now, the Windows option is only to set up Windows 10, and we, we do have few clients who have done that. I mean, it, it, it works uh, fine. Uh, all you got to do is uh, you need to install Jupyter Notebook and make sure that Hyper-V is, is working on those Windows uh, 10 servers, and then that works, yes. Great. Thanks, Mohammed. And I know uh, Rich Chester just uh, finished working on a Jupyter uh, implementation yesterday for, uh, for one of our clients, and they were very excited about that. Um, another question is, we already have Jupyter Server. Can we use it with Cognos, or do we need to set up an, the IBM version? So that's a good question, right? Uh, you need to set up an IBM version because the, the benefit of having an IBM version is you get uh, integration into Cognos, right? You get all the good stuff that IBM, Cognos comes with, right, security, uh, scheduling, all of those. Plus, there are libraries uh, to read data and write data back to Cognos. So it is better to Mohamed, your audio is cutting out. Try that again. That's, that's okay. Certain. So what I want to say, is, again, is it better now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So again, uh, as far as your existing notebooks are concerned, you are not losing those the, the work you have already put in. Those are all those are it's very easy to migrate. You simply drag and drop uh, those uh, notebooks on top of Cognos, and it basically uh, simply uploads as you upload any Excel file, right? Uh, so it, it's better to simply just uh, install a Jupyter notebook for Cognos and you start utilizing that. Okay, uh, we'll go with one more question here, Mohammed. Um, is the scheduling of the data load 
only available in this version of Cognos. Which version is this again? Uh, based on uh, it must have been Kenya when you were demonstrating. So Jupyter Notebook uh, got introduced into Cognos starting 11.1.2. So starting then, you have the scheduling available uh, for notebooks. All right, that was a quick answer, so I'll ask you one more. What authentication is passed to Jupyter from Cognos? Is it the user in Cognos, or is it the Cognos service account? No, no. So that is uh, Jupyter. Uh, so that is uh, the user who logged in into Cognos. So that's the authentication that gets passed into Jupyter Notebook server. Okay, great. And 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 I see, like I said, there's a, there's a few more questions, but uh, in the spirit of uh, keeping us on track, we'll save those for uh, this afternoon. Um, and um, I'm going to start. I'm going to Mohammed. Why don't you pause your screen, and I'm going to work on. Uh, Passing the ball to our next presenter, uh, Mr. Chris uh, Christopher Keaton, um, and Chris is going to be doing a uh, a presentation uh, around uh, you know kind of optimizing performance and using data sets and data modules uh, first. And then he actually is uh, starting the show twice today. He has two different presentations, but we're going to start. Um, with that, and Chris, you can share your screen now um, as you have the ball, and you should be able to um, uh, get going. Please, please do a quick introduction of yourself uh, and um, and set up the the presentation. And I'll turn myself off. Ball yours. Um, hey there, guys. You unmute yourself. Uh, there you go. Now I can hear you. Yep. Hi. No. Nope. Okay. Um, Pardon? <laughs> Chris, your audio is a little choppy. Um, reboot again. We'll do my best. So hello, everyone. I am Chris Keaton, a principal consultant with LPA. I've been doing Cognos now for a good 20 years. I hate to admit that because that makes me seem much older than I want to seem. But then again, you're seeing me on camera, so you know uh, that's... <laughs> That's the reality of the, the, uh, the situation here today. So <clears throat> the goal of today's uh, first presentation here is all about moving things uh, faster, right? Your business moves fast, your analytics need to match that pace. And one of the great ways that Cognos has brought functionality to you uh, in this space is with data sets and data modules. It's really kind of exciting because this is what catapults Cognos Analytics ahead of a lot of the competitors. Uh, Cognos has always been a great enterprise strength tool, but some of that sort of local processing, fast analysis, stuff like that has, has been um, answered here with data sets and data modules. So quite simply, data sets and data modules are all about speed and flexibility. Data sets, they provide that speed while the data module provides that flexibility. Data sets were introduced in 11.04, uh, and that sort of speed and flexibility is based on uh, the, the dependency on re repeated database queries being lessened, right? You bring that data set up into the, the memory on your server, and no more are you reaching out back and forth to those database uh, queries when people are running repeated uh, queries of the same types of data. In R7, we introduced the concept of data modules, and that was really where the excitement of altering the way we do modeling sort of entered into the picture. Now, there was actually a little sliver of what became data modules available, even way back in Cognos 10, being that external data sources functionality, right? where you could bring in a spreadsheet or a file and, and attach it to something and report on it. But it wasn't until that R7 release where data modules really sort of became a modeling tool that you could say uh, began to compete a little bit with our traditional framework manager model. Okay, so data modules in general provide us that ability to stitch together what I'll say are infinite sources, right? Files, data tables, other packages, and take advantage of memory management and, and all those unprecedented outputs that, that really 
back in the day would have potentially cost you days or weeks of work each month, sort of toiling away in that in that data dungeon. You know, the I've got to pull all these things together to make that output because uh, I've got data coming from multiple sources. So at high level, what is the data set? As I mentioned, it's a cache collection of data items. It's used to increase performance, reduce workload on the database, and uh, can help you keep a point in time view of the data, right? So you can refresh a data set and hold it and report against that while data is changing underneath. You can also refresh your data set frequently so that it, it's giving you near time um, and, and close to real time uh, view of data as well, leveraging that in memory performance. So traditionally, Cognos and other users, even through applications and, and other front end things, are hitting that production database. Cognos is making requests, users are making requests, that database is handling it diligently as things come through. Now, how do data sets sort of make a little bit more efficiency here? They're going to call into that database one time, right? Each time you execute the, the refresh, one time, maybe once an hour, or once every five minutes, whatever schedule you choose and bring that data onto the Cognos server so you're now dealing with it locally rather than back and forth to the production database. So not only do you get that speed of having the data nearby, you also get to reduce that workload on the database and even the network, right? So it's you know, less, less data flying over the wires between the database and Cognos as uh, these types of things happen. <clears throat> so, why would I use a data set? First, when reusing a result set can benefit you in some way, right? So, I like to think of it um, prompts, common prompts, right? If you have a set of eight or ten common prompts that you're always asking people about, why query that uh, data set over and over again every time someone runs a report when you can feed those prompts directly from a data set that's stored and refreshed on a, on a on a schedule that fits your uh, data strategy. Second, uh, when performance matters, obviously I think you can probably already understand that, that the performance of the data set will increase as you're leveraging in memory capabilities and you're, you're reducing that uh, network traffic and all the like. You know, an interesting use case is the third one when ETL just can't keep up, right? I, I, I'm not out here to sort of pick on any ETL teams. Um, they're all doing great work. I have a lot of peers who do ETL, we love them but sometimes there's a heavy backlog, right? And that whole idea of moving at the speed of business is what we're talking about here. So if you have a case where maybe you determine the need for a summary table, or you determine the need to bring two disparate data sources together, the choice sometimes is, is that an ETL project? Do I create that summary table in the database? Do I bring those sources together? Um, is it a SQL view that I put in place, right? Some of these things have lead times. You as the Cognos team with data sets have the ability to sort of jump ahead, bring these data sources into your environment, and then you'll see in a second stitch them together with data modules to sort of get you past that uh, hurdle and the backlog that may be for moving physical uh, data. You know, some of you may know a little bit of DBA speak and things like that. A data set you know, is really sort of akin to what I call a, a materialized view in a way, right? It makes physical something that's a logical concept, and that physical concept is on your BI server. You can also use it to simplify sources from your existing models. So, you know, for instance, imagine you've got this massive framework manager package, and it's got everything you need in your business, and you're moving into Cognos 11, and you're starting to say, whoa, do I really need all of this? Uh, to, to write my reports. Well, you can start, use your data set to pick and choose the fields that you really need and bring them into the data set and sort of simplify, it, simplify that interface for folks. And then finally, to get around the cost of joining multiple data sources. Creative modelers, we can bring multiple data sources together. That's not really a new concept, but occasionally when we do that, there is a quote unquote cost to that, right? Things slow down a little bit if you're crossing platforms and crossing servers and the like. Well, you don't have to worry about the platform. You don't have to worry about the server um, when you're talking about using data sets. 
Where they work best is going to be uh, in using them to create individual little tables. Now, the data module pairs so well with this because in the data module world, we can use not only framework packages and relational tables and all like, we can also use data sets. So you can imagine sort of a view, if it, you will, a set, set of views, almost a logical data warehouse, a logical data mart you could make using data sets and joining them together in the data module, all of this occurring in memory. So now what is the data module really? It's a metadata model. You author it in the web browser, you integrate all of those data source types, the tables, the framework packages, uploaded files. Think about it as framework manager plus some extra stuff. Especially in these later versions of the data modules, you, you really have a good competitor for framework manager capabilities. I know that's a controversial opinion, but it's one that I'll stand by. So framework manager plus natural language processing and artificial intelligence, the AI-based automatic modeling the data module will intuit relationships, data types, things like that for you. Take some of that step that you would have to do one by one by one out of the work process for you as you start to build a model. The ability to automate the creation of relative time periods, right? So if you have quarter date, month to date, a lot of us in framework manager would spend a lot of time creating relational date periods year to date, months to date, things like that, rolling periods. Um, and some of you out there may have used Transformer, and we loved Transformer because it could go ahead and do all those relative date periods for us at the click of a box. Well, guess what? Data modules now have that capability to generate massive amounts of relational date uh, with simple couple click type work. I think I've already talked enough about the in-memory, the idea of materialized views and caching and also that integration of file-based data sources. So, you know, bring things in, tie them all together, and then report against them just like we're used to under a normal situation. So the first scenario I'd like to show you in, in terms of a demo is, uh, let's imagine we're the VP of analytics, gave some of us a promotion for a sporting goods retailer. You'll never guess the sporting goods retailer who's considering consolidating their product lines. Some of these lines have seen an increase in return. So as I look to create this consolidated product line, I want to sort of validate sales and returns and understand what's really going on out here. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a couple data sets. We're going to join them in a data module and then we're going to report against them. And you're going to see just how simple this can be. All right, so hopefully we can see my Cogno screen here. And what you'll see is the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna navigate out to a traditional framework package. In this case, it's going to be our friend, the sporting goods company that you know is right outdoors. We're gonna right click and create a data set. It's gonna open the data set interface, which as you, you're gonna see here is a very simple interface. It's really based similarly on the reporting interface, but stripped down to give you just the things you need. We're going to add a couple of different product attributes, the product line and then the product type. We're going to scroll down a little bit and uh, add some time elements, mainly the year and then the date. And as you see when we're adding, it's going to keep refreshing. Now the checkbox at the bottom says summarize detail values, so I'm getting a distinct list of these values as I go, which is kind of nice. We're going to go up and we're going to add a couple of measures. This time uh, we're going to add quantity and revenue to our data set. I can see we're getting pretty good refresh speed here, as one would expect a little bit from Great Outdoors. But when you're working with a data set, you, you, you see good performance just about all the time. So notice we can now go and add filters to the data set. Clicking on a header will bring up the, the ability to click on the filter icon and then choose uh, a number of options, including individual or range-based filters. In this case, we're looking at recent history, so we're going to say year greater than 2012 and click OK. Another filter we can add is based on product line. So we'll go ahead, create a custom filter, 
and turn on camping equipment and mountaineering equipment, which I'm going to call my new adventure product line. So other things you can see up there, sorting and the like. Sorting would help performance by getting uh, data together. So if you're constantly filtering uh, and prompting on values, definitely think about sorting. So we're going to save here. We're going to call it Adventure Sales 2012 and Beyond. And go ahead, I'm going to save it my my content for the moment, because for now, I just want to work with this myself. You can see it's saved and loaded. That's the important part, right? We need to load this onto the server. So you choose save and load to bring it into memory. Now we're going to go back out and we're going to work on the returns. Now for the purposes of uh, imagination, let's just pretend this return source is a totally different package. There's no reason why it has to be from the same package. I'm just doing it as a matter of a quick demo of convenience. It could be another database platform. It could be another package altogether. So because I know I'm going to have to join these, I want to make sure to bring over product line and product type. I'm also going to go and get my year and my date. And then we're going to go up top, grab my measure. In this case, since we're looking at returns, it is going to be return quantity. Now I'm going to add the filters. Okay, I'm going to go and add the 2012 forward filter. And I'm going to also add the product line filter. Now, do I really have to do these filters on this? You could probably get away with changing the join type in the data module that we're going to come to. And the join would essentially act like a filter. But since we're looking for performance, I'm going to add the filters in both places so that we've got a nice sort of consolidated data set. Save it and load. And we'll put it in the same place and call it Adventure Returns 2012 Forward. As that loads, and it'll take a second or two, and it loaded successfully. Now, let's go outside. I say let's go outside. Let's go to the front end of uh, Cognos Analytics here and take a look. In my content, you'll see the two objects we just created. What I want to do is look at a little bit about their properties. How big are they? How many rows? How many columns? When was it last refreshed, right? So if we scroll to the bottom down here under advanced, you can see the size of it, uh, the number of rows, the number of columns, and how long it took to refresh, along with who refreshed it, and then up top at quick glance, sort of when it was created, modified, or refreshed. Okay, now normally we would put these guys on a schedule, right? You would put it on a schedule of refreshing daily, or schedule refreshing every five minutes um, to take advantage of how quickly your data changes. Scheduling is the same as uh, any other schedule. So here we go and start to create a new data module. We're going to pick our two sources. By the way, any data source is good here for the data module, but we're going to work with the data sets because that's the topic. If we look at the grid tab in data modules, you see data comes back, comes back nice and fast. You see that it has all our data. We can sort it and, and play with it here. You can also go to the Relationships tab. And you'll see both of those files has been, have been brought in. Uh, they're currently unrelated, so I need to do a little bit of work to bring them together. Okay, so what I'm going to do is select them both. And then we'll right click and choose New Relationship. The Friendly Relationship Editor screen will come up. I'll choose Product Type and Product Type. See that it previews and we match. And then I will choose date and date to match on date as well. See the blue and red is nice. It tells you which side data is coming from. And then we set relationship type cardinality and optimization. So what is optimization really about? That is going to be um, some between statements, maybe an in clause, something to speed up your results based on the relationship, it's going to affect the SQL and hopefully give you better performance. If you're in doubt, choose no filtering and that'll work too. We refresh, we see our data come back, and we feel good about that cardinality and all the choices that we've made. So there now I see the two things are, are brought together. We go up to our friendly neighborhood try it button, which lets us take this into the reporting interface without the burden of having to save it quite yet. And you see in the reporting interface, I have a simple list report. 
I can take product line, product type, revenue quantity, and return quantity, drag those guys over into the list, switch over into page preview mode, see data come back almost instantaneously. And just let's try out a calculation just for fun. So quantity, return quantity, we'll put a simple uh, calculation there and see the resultant non-return product count. So if this looks good to us, I feel comfortable. See all the things I can do with a normal report. Of course, we can't save it and try it, but it lets us feel comfortable. And then we're going to go ahead and do a save as. I'm going to save this module right into the same folder as the other two, because it's not quite ready for prime time yet. I'm going to leave it by my content, but we're going to call it Adventure Sales and Returns Analysis. Now, of course, the promotion, quote unquote, process of this is going to be quite simple, right? You don't have to worry about a big publish. I can, quote unquote, promote this by moving it out into a public folder that people are going to have access to. Okay. Now, it wouldn't be a Chris Keat demo if we didn't have a fun scenario. I'm a big fan of the fun scenario. This one, how about we run one of the world's largest and most beautiful resorts, right? We've got restaurants and bars and pools, casinos, all kinds of things coming out of our areas, places that we all want to be, unless any of you are quarantining at this resort, in which case email me, I'm coming. We want to Take a look at our venues, right? So the example here is the pool's getting overcrowded. It's getting close to capacity, but we see that the beach bar is nearly empty. So as a management team, what I want to do is I want to make an announcement that we're going to do a daiquiri making class at the beach bar. And students, of course, get to sample their own creations. Save this one for the virtual happy hour. It's a lot of data, and it's going to require some pretty high performance. Uh, so we can't wait for an hour for the source update and five minutes for the dashboard to refresh. It has to be relatively quick performance, and that's what we're talking about here. Now, I'm really using this example to show you how cool and how quickly you can make a data module. And in this case, I am going to use an external file just to share with you a little bit about what, um, you know, Excel files and data modules do together. Okay, so realize this would probably be a big, heavy transactional backend system. I'm going to use an example Excel file but you'll, you'll get the points here on what the benefits of both are. So what we're going to do is we're going to open our resort file. This file, by the way, has three tabs in it, venue, traffic, and loyalty. Okay, so, and we're going to take it. We're going to drag it out of the screen. You see a quick launch doc, data module exploration dashboard. I dropped it right into data module. So I'm telling it this spreadsheet, I want to write a data module against don't waste my time, just bring it right into that data module interface. Now look, it was smart enough to recognize that there are three tables in that spreadsheet, which are equivalent to the three tabs. What else did it do? It created the relationship because it was smart enough to recognize that all three tabs had venue key. Some of them had uh, other information that could help make that relationship. And you see it created a default row ID. That's hidden. But there are other fields I might want to hide, such as the keys, which don't make much sense to the end user. Part of the reason I'm showing you this is because even though it's in the spreadsheet, I'm going to use the data module to sort of clean up and make this a little more ready for prime time. So we're going to go ahead and save it. We're going to save it as resort traffic, save it into my content, and we're going to go out there and we're going to create a quick little dashboard on it once we uh, are confident that we like the way it looks. So right click on resort traffic, create a dashboard. We'll see the dashboard interface once we click a tab to single template. Now, as far as I'm concerned, this doesn't have to be a spreadsheet, right? We look at it, the user says, hey, this is just the data I want to play with. They're going to go ahead and take venue type, occupancy, and time, drag it onto the page. Note, some of these can expand. That's also a nice little piece of functionality. So 
We drag it on the page. And at first, hey, and it's a little busy for my liking for a dashboard. Um, I have a touch of what the kids call the OCD, so I could sit here and, and resize things for the entire day, but I, I'll, I'll stop. Um, <clears throat> what I am going to do, though, is use this filter doc. I'm going to bring the venue type field over into the filter doc, and I'm going to zero in specifically on the bar and recreation, because if you remember, we're talking about shifting people from my pool area out to my bar area, and you can see the traffic is spiking at the recreation facilities but my, uh, my bars are sort of hanging out, not doing much in terms of uh, heavy occupancy. So now a second uh, visualization I might want to add based on this little data module is one that uses uh, time, venue name, and revenue. We stretch it out a little bit. We see there's a nice little heat map. Grab the little handle on there, move it around a little bit. Stretch her to the right, stretch to the left. And you can see my beach bar is doing not much activity at noon and one, but as soon as I made that announcement from two to three, we start to see that increase. The tool tips, they're there. And assuming that if we did have this against a live system and not a spreadsheet, one of the things that's really great about this is refresh automatically, right? We know on our dashboards, we can turn on a 60 second refresh for each one of these widgets. And we'll go ahead and see each one of these is now gonna refresh every 60 seconds. And I'll be able to watch my traffic in real time shift based on the announcement that I made. Okay. So, uh, to, to wrap up the data set and data module piece, um, I, I truly believe that data sets and data modules can accomplish just about anything, right? They're incredible workarounds. Okay, the example there when I say workaround in quotes, what I'm getting at is the, a classic example where you have two packages with different data and we can't combine them in the same list report. How about I create a data set from package A, a data set from package B, merge them in a data module, and then I can combine them in that list report, right? So it's a great little workaround for one of the most uh, restrictive little rules we still have to deal with in, in report authoring. You can use this to get around it. But it's not only that, it's a whole lot more, right? It's a great opportunity to jumpstart. If you have a big old Cognos 10 environment today and you want to modernize your implementation and start taking advantage of some of that in-memory capability, you can write data sets against your data sources and immediately start to modernize and have very flexible uh, metadata assets to use, making that modeling accessible to more people. You know, we do framework manager training, we do do data module training. The data module training, a very effective, uh, you know, plug for the upcoming class uh, in, a, in a week or two, um, in a day, right? Framework modeling takes a lot longer to understand. This data module, you can pick it up pretty quickly because it is more accessible. Technically, your analytic explorers can get their hands on it. You don't have to make it available to everybody, but you do have a pretty broad swath. You can allow um, a lot of self-service when it comes to modeling. Um, in my last most controversial little sentence, I think that's the reason Cognos can easily beat Tableau and Power BI, because now not only do we have that fullness of functionality that Cognos has always had, we also have that speed and flexibility to do that sort of in-memory quick analysis. So we've got the best of both worlds, enterprise scale and desktop speed and flexibility. All right, so that is Chris. That, that was outstanding, and uh, I really appreciate you uh, kind of driving home a, a key point um, on that on, on your last sentence of your presentation. Um, just frankly, I was at the um, Texas User Group two months ago, and um, a lot of our clients that are uh, I suspect on the phone here uh, that uh, our, our Cognos fans, uh, feel the pressure in their organizations from these other tools kind of encroaching. And one of the most common questions that came up at the last user group I was at was, so how do we push back on that? Um, that point you just made, I mean, it's probably worth making one more time and then I'll make, uh, then I'll, then I'll give you three questions that came up of the, of the about 13. Okay. okay. Um, yeah, so really that's the thing, right? I always think of uh, Cognos 
as being you know that enterprise scale but now uh, now powerful right at your level sort of reporting it's, it really is the best of both worlds um, you don't have to take advantage of all the enterprise strength right um, you can use it as a as a nice comfortable local tool right you know for you but you have the best of both worlds so once your stuff starts to take off you can distribute it to the world that's great thank you chris all right let me ask this question question came up that says, can we create data sets with complex queries like joining multiple queries, union of union, and advanced calculations filters like year equals 2010 or year equals 2011, like advanced queries like that? Right. So, you know, that's, that's a good question, definitely. Um, I, I think the data set functionality I would use to create the pieces, right? I, I think of it like a, like a recipe for a, a delicious cake, not that I'm hungry right now. Uh, you get the individual ingredients on the table, right? We'll bring in query one, query two, query three in the form of a couple of different data sets. We'll use the data modules to do that advanced work, right? That's where you would do your traditional modeling. You can do the advanced calculations, you can bring things together. Um, I, I really think of the data set as part of the data collection process. It, it does allow you to do some basic things, filtering, sorting, et cetera, but it doesn't give you, you know, I'd say the full set of things that you would use the data module to, to achieve. Great. Thank you, sir. All right. Uh, a question that came in earlier in your presentation, um, where are data modules saved? Content store database or server? And it, can it be modified to save on the server? So where are data modules saved? Data modules are going to be part of the content store, um, you know, typical type of uh, document stored in your content store. Um, as far as data sets go, which I think might sort of be the, the question, perhaps, the data set is kind of interesting. It becomes... Um, it's like, like an Adobe Parquette file. It's like a little, you know, a little file that gets stored on, you know, on the server and pulled into memory uh, as you're as you're using it. So, um, you know, it, as far as I know, there's not a great way to sort of customize where that gets stored. But it, it's all happening on your Cognos uh, Cognos tier when you're using it, and uh, things get stored back to the content store when you're not. Okay, great. Um, so Chris, it, it's 2.45, but I'm, I'm just going to ask you another question. I, you know, you can take time, steal time from the next presenter, that's fine. I'll yeah, that next you. presenter is a real deadbeat, so we want to we wanna take as much time as possible from him. Okay, so uh, the example you did appears to be joining into a list report. Can data sets, data modules be applied to a cross tab? If so, and the set module is a list, can it still be applied to a cross tab? So your data module, once it's published, good question, the data module is as effective as any other package you might have created. So you can write anything against it, right? We can do cross tabs, we can do visualizations, you can do all manner of things um, against it. In fact, you know, <clears throat> It's not exactly the question, but one of the things that just came to mind is that I was answering that question. Um, for those of you that are on the higher end scale of like the data scientists and whatnot, working with AI and natural language processing, a data set might be a great data prep tool for that, right? You can clean up uh, data and make it simpler in a way so that your AI and NLP system can take advantage of that cleaned up data set. So yeah, once it's in the data module, and published out as a, as a data module, you can write anything you want against it. Okay, super. Um, with that, why don't, why don't we transition, um, and uh, I'll take a, take a minute for you, Chris, to, to transition from, uh, from the topics that you just covered to um, the over, uh, overview of Modio functionality. Um, and uh, just, you know, while you're getting ready to share your, your next uh, screen here, for, for everybody in the audience, you know, uh, Modio, we're, LTA is a partner with, with Modio, and, and they, um, you know, 
many of you know them, but for those of you who don't, um, I would recommend listening to this because it has a lot of functionality here that can uh, assist with your, your Cognos uh, environment and, um, you know, performing upgrades and so forth. So uh, uh, Chris is going to cover that. So All right. there you go. Chris looks like you're keyed up and ready to go. So, again, I'm going to go on hold here and uh, pass the ball. So I considered, uh, should I put on a fake mustache? Should I take my glasses off? I could put on a different hat to talk about Modio. Uh, ooh, I don't think LPA or Modio or IBM want to endorse the Boston Red Sox, but I will. Um, so I'm going to change hats. I'm going to talk a little bit about Modio. Sorry for my cheesy jokes. So Modio is a great opportunity for you, especially when you're doing upgrades. But, you know, I'm going to focus there primarily for this upcoming section. But I, I do want to draw your attention to the fact that Modio is a lot more than just upgrades, right? Modio can handle the details of your administrative workload so that you can focus on the bigger picture, uh, you know, in terms of the rest of your job, which I'm sure is going to be a lot more than worrying about security, worrying about old content in your database, uh, you know, keeping an eye on the things that really matter. So that's sort of why I say focus on the big picture. Let's let Modio handle those details. So there's two facts that we can all hopefully agree on. One, we all have zombie content in our content stores, right? You've got those reports that maybe you haven't run a consistency check recently and there's a bunch of, you know, old my content sitting around taking up space. Uh, reports that people wrote four or five years ago that no one has run in, in, in years. Uh, so that, that kind of zombie content is sitting there sort of waiting to jump out at us and, and, and chomp on our, on our reports. Um, so that's the first fact. We've all got it. There's no shame to it. The second is we're all data-driven people, right? If you're listening to this conversation, you are someone who data is, if not your life, it's definitely your livelihood, right? So why, why would we not take a data-driven approach to managing our application, right? Cognos, if it, you know, I, I joke, I said Cognos has paid my mortgage for close to 20 years um, and it may be paying many of yours. So let's love our application and take that data-driven approach that we would apply to our own data and apply it to the management of um, that application that pays the mortgage. So we know our content stores and our audit stores are wildly complex, right? I don't like to peer behind that curtain very often because you look at it and you see all these, you know, gooey IDs and, and crazy uh, strings of characters that, you know, at first glance don't make a whole lot of sense to me. You do have the ability to sort of query and get in here, but it's, it's sort of like hacking through a, a rainforest with a machete. So Modio has hacked through that, main, that uh, rainforest for us, right? It helps make sense of this crazy complex content and audit store and brings the key stuff. You know, you think about uh, here the signal emits the noise. It brings that signal forward to the surface so that we can, like I said, concentrate on the things that matter and don't worry about hacking through that uh, forest of the content store or the audit store. So what are some of the tools? Modio CI uh, and PI are probably the most familiar to us. Some of us probably own it already. Uh, Modio CI is that version control, automated deployment and testing capability, right? You run those test cases and you see your cloudy skies or your, your sunny skies. Uh, Modio PI, the non-pro version, is the one that you can download and gives you some of the functionality of Modio PI. But where the real action's at is Modio PI Pro, where you've got that ability to not only document the environment security schedules, but you can also interact, make mass updates, validation of changes, et cetera. The mass update example is a great one because I'll bet you a lot of us have things like um, image paths in our reports. I have, uh, you know, in a former life, I, I had a, an image, everyone had used hard-coded images on their reports. And we ended up having to keep our Cognos Gateway, our old Cognos Gateway alive for years after we had moved on to a new version of Cognos just to serve those images because no one wanted to go back through 10,000 reports and update the company logo that happened to have been hard-coded. I'm sure many of you are smart and have dynamic links, but if you're in that kind of a boat, 
mass updates like that are no brainers with Modio PI Pro. They also have the report card that does monitoring and stress testing and also report and package assessments, let you know how you're doing, um, sort of like the, um, you know, the package analyzer there on steroids. And the one that we're going to talk most about here with the time that I have is the inventory and reduction tool. Because I am sort of pitching this from the perspective of the upgrade, inventory and reduction is your main tool into identifying that unused or little used content, grouping content into high, medium, and low complexity reports, and then allowing you to reduce that off the content store in a way that if you realize after the fact you've made a mistake, you can come back from and bring it back, right? One of the things I always tell people is, you know, there's no great recycle bin in Cognos, right? You delete something, sometimes you're in trouble. Um, with the Modio tools, not only can you bring things back, you can also um, do them in groups like with this reduction. One of the questions that, you know, often gets asked before we move into inventory and reduction is, so, you know, what comes with that 30-day trial we hear about that comes with the IBM upgrade? And just to, to shoot that one out right now, it's Modio CI, right? The version control automated deployment and testing. And it is for a sandbox environment, right? So it's Modio CI installed on a sandbox. It is not Modio CI installed necessarily on your production server, okay? So if you wanna go beyond CI on the sandbox, including into inventory reduction, uh, we're gonna discuss about some options for, for uh, acquiring the software license. They're very, very nicely priced and not um, generally difficult to put together. So inventory and reduction. So what it's gonna do for us is identify those good candidates for removal, identify the priority reports to help us know what we need to look at for testing purposes. And as I said, <laughs> I, I, I can only think of the movie, but I hear the purge noise. Um, we're gonna purge and have the ability to uh, restore, which that's one thing the purge movies don't have, uh, the ability to restore content. <clears throat> so let's look at that selected functionality over there. Inventory your object, take a look at broken links, uh, which packages are used, which packages aren't used. You might actually have packages that aren't being used at all anymore. Listing your content store, deleting those unused or old reports, and some user statistics. It actually, inventory reduction gives you some information about uh, what your users are doing as well. So what does it look like? Um, first of all, we have a, you know, when you put inventory reduction together, it becomes uh, some additional tabs in a CI environment. You see the inventory tab and the reduction tab. You configure it to point to your content store and your audit store. Uh, so it can sort of keep its foot in both ponds, as it were. So you're, you're sort of merging information in a way that's tricky to do. Hey, you could maybe use a data set or a data module to do that, but again, let's let Modio do it for us, right? So it becomes part of the web portal for Modio. Um, what does it feel like? Well, you create a job and that job runs at whatever schedule you want it to. So for instance, you see here this inventory range, the audit date range is uh, February 19 to August 19. Um, it tells you how many packages, how many reports, uh, unreferenced packages, duplicate artifacts there. And then the most important thing here is the download button because you're gonna download that inventory archive. Because while this information is great, it's just the tip of the iceberg for what you're really gonna be using. So when you download that uh, archive, you'll see it's actually you know, a big old zip file that has a bunch of uh, spreadsheets in it. Uh, the spreadsheets, you can see content by package, object counts, report stats, user login stats. There's a lot of information. And what's great about it is by serving it up in Excel, it's incredibly portable too, right? It's offline. You don't need to, you know, if you want to review this with people, you can send it out. It's available, you know, in, in a way that's very consumable. You could, you know, sit on an airplane and then look at your uh, unreferenced packages. <clears throat> the inventory workbook is the primary, I'll say at the table of contents for this, right? So you open it up. And you see there's, uh, there's a literal table of contents, which has, you know, duplicate names, not run recently, recently used, et cetera. The simple moderate complex, which is really helpful, reports that use uh, native queries. So let's call those guys out. 
reports that have HTML items in them. Absolutely important to know. And then this filters tab, which allows us to um, change some of the definitions, right? So you might already have asked, hey, how do I define what's recent versus not recent, right? To some people, recent could be 30 days. To others, it could be three years. So you do have the ability to go to this filter changing spot within this massive interwoven spreadsheet and change some of these settings. So for instance, you can see, um, you know, the ability to set the minimum number of executions to be considered recent, right? You can see the ability to define how many queries makes a simple report versus a moderate report, right? <clears throat> some of these actually, you know, to say that a simple report is five queries, you might go uh, to me, a simple report's one query. Um, so you can come in here and you can change this and then refresh the data and it'll redraw all the spreadsheets for you against those parameters rather than what was generated for you. So you don't have to go back in and rerun the inventory. You can update it right here in Excel. So here's some example output, right? We've got the not run, run recently. In this case, it's uh, 365 days was the definition of recent, but as you know, that's definable. Uh, and we have the, here you see the display name, you do see the path is available as well as the type, what was the query mode, and there's a lot more columns here that I couldn't even show on the screenshot. For instance, what are some of these columns? How many queries are there? How many filters? Are there specific security policies on this report? Uh, how many containers, data containers, list reports, vis visualizations? How, how many things are on the pages of that report? Who's the owner? Is it currently the victim of parsing errors? Is it a burst report, right? And you can see over here in the green, there's a lot more than what I just called out. Um, some very interesting data that you've got right there about all of your reports. So using these, you can then prioritize, right? So it's not just about getting rid of old reports that no one's run in a while. It can also be from the other use case, which is, gosh, what do I really need to look at, right? If I'm doing an upgrade, I wanna look at my SQL reports. I wanna look at my HTML item reports. I'm sure a lot of us have been burned by JavaScript not working you know, after an upgrade, right? You wanna look at these re reports specifically and make sure that they're at the top of the list for testing. So then once we identify these things, you can begin your reduction, right? So you select and reduce your reports. It'll tell you there what reports have been reduced and the number of objects reduced. Now you might say, wait a second, uh, you know, compensation report there, it says objects reduced three, but that looks like a single report. Well, one of the great things that's involved here with this tool is smart reduction, which says if it cleans up a report, it's also going to clean up all the things that are hung off of that report, such as all these report views, right? So actual versus planned was reduced because I asked for it to be reduced based on the feedback, but it also went out and cleaned out the report views attached to it um, as the reason you can see here, reduction cascade, right? Because if I remove the main report, obviously those views are going to be orphaned and we don't want them out there um, to lure people in. Okay, so that smart reduction is another great feature here of inventory reduction. So now it's a few days later and I get a phone call from somebody and they say, oh, oh, oh hey, wait a second. Um, you know, this is my report that I run once every two years. I said, okay, interesting choice for a report, but it's my report that I run once every two years. I need to get it back. Well, you can go back in and look at the revision history of what you've cleaned up. And you can see what was cleaned up. You can see what was deleted. You can see all the information you need and you can bring it back. Okay, so you can undo a reduction. For instance, we come back and we say, I need returns by product type back. You see on that list in the reduction details report, there's an undo action on the right side that allows me to bring it back into my environment. So, you know, consider that kind of the, the really nice safety net on this, right? If we went through our content store before an upgrade and cleaned it up, which is a great thing to do regardless, but this is smart, right? And if I just deleted a bunch of things, uh, 
I'm not, I'm not going to get them back very easily. I mean, I guess I could take a content back up and stand up a server on the side. And move, you know, it, no, this is this is nice automated all in this one product that lets you bring things back uh, from the dead, which then brings me back to my initial zombie concept, right? <laughs> so what are some tips for success? Um, number one, be aggressive. Be aggressive. Or as John Malkovich would say in Rounders, aggressive. Be aggressive because you can recover things. You can get these back. So, you know, when you're cleaning up before an upgrade, I mean, there, there are stats here saying you can save yourself lots and lots of money and time by cleaning things up in advance that you're not going to be chasing ghosts once you start doing your testing, right? You don't want to spend time fixing a report that no one uses. So be aggressive because you know you can recover things. Also, make sure to clean up those dependent objects, right? Um, go in there. It's going to clean things up. You're going to make sure all your views and all your schedules and all those things are cleaned up. But also, don't take it on all yourself, right? Use Modio. Use your fellow analysts and your fellow Cognos, uh, Cognots, if you will, and review these things together and make decisions uh, that are going to be successful in the long run. So don't forget to be aggressive, but also don't forget to share and work together. All right. I appreciate the time. I hope you see that that's kind of a really neat little tool and uh, it could be worth a lot of our time. And feel free to uh, reach out if you have additional questions. So, um, Chris, yes, there were additional questions. So I'm going to, I've got three questions here. Now, uh, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to preface this, Don. I may have to defer a couple questions because I am, Chris Keaton, IBM LPA. I'm not Chris Keaton Modio. So I'm going to do my best, but if I have to defer, you'll forgive me. Yeah, I, I probably will. Okay. Um, here you go. Let me, let me read away. Uh, we use IBM ID for our Cognos Analytics on cloud environment and wanted to use Modio, but could never get it to connect. I don't know if you have uh, any knowledge about the ability for Cognos uh, Analytics on cloud to work with Modio. Mm-hmm. Um, it would be speculation, <laughs> so I'm going to take a uh, I'm going to take a pass on that one. I know that you know if you have access to your content store and your audit store, there shouldn't be any reason why it wouldn't work. Um, but you know, there's bigger questions at play in terms of you know which type of cloud are we talking about? Public, private? Do we have VPN configured? Where do the databases sit? There are a lot of questions that we might need to to use to refine that uh, answer, but. I don't see any okay. reason technically why that would be difficult. Did I talk too long? Didn't okay, so one, one of the things I will make sure we do is get that answer out um, uh, directly from Modio. Um, I've gotten some input here from an IBMer uh, live while we're talking um, that it, it should work with Cognos on cloud. Uh, but again, as you just pointed out, uh, Chris, there's a lot of variables here. Let me, let me yep. go on to another um, question. Is Modio only high-level report referencing, or can it look at the details of those reports? So, good question, but, uh, you know, define detail, right? So, I mean, if you look at all those columns that were on that one slide, right, and, and feel free to ask for the slide deck uh, to get that screenshot, but, I mean, the, it really is digging into the guts of the report, right? If you think about that, like counting the number of queries, counting the number of containers, all, all the objects, I, I love the idea of, you know, is it parsing correctly, right? So it is, it is in up to its elbows. Um, so I'd say it's, it's pretty darn detailed, yeah. Okay, one of the advantages of having an Apple ID or an Apple Watch is people can send you text messages while you're answering questions and give input. Uh, I'm just gonna ask you one, one final, uh, question here on the Modio topic. Um, okay. And I think it, 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 it is a, just a further level of detail of the question you just answered. Um, would we be able to use Modio to look for renamed fields that may be referenced in reports? Or is there another tool that can do that in analytics? Example, if commercial was misspelled when created, but has since been dragged into calculations on multiple reports. So you do have the ability to get in and do these mass updates uh, with data items in the reports. Uh, so you, you, I, 
I am very confident that this is a capability that you will see. Um, it's not an inventory and reduction capability, but it, it definitely is something um, in the CIPI stack that you should take advantage of. Outstanding. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, hopefully that, that Modio uh, section here provided value to our, to our listeners, so to speak, and to the people in the meeting. Um, Brendan Austin is going to get ready to go here, and I'm going to move the ball to him. Um, but again, if you have um, Modio, further Modio uh, questions or you're interested in the tool, um, we certainly can, um, uh, LPA can help you out with that. Um, we're a reseller and we work very closely with the uh, engineering team at, at Modio. And um, so uh, just follow up and let us know. Um, Brendan Austin is going to get started here. Brendan is our Director uh, of Financial Performance Management Practice, or I like to just call it Financial Analytics. Um, and um, Brendan, I, I see your, your presentation. You've got a great box on the top right corner. There you go. And if you could drag that a little further, that would be great. Um, Brendan uh, is is a, located in the central time zone in the United States, and uh, we've had folks from Eastern time zone, central, where, like I said, our, our uh, eight presenters here are all over the U.S. Um, with that, Brendan, I'm going to hand it to you and uh, let you run. Thank you, Don. Uh, can you hear me okay? I can hear you great. Okay, awesome. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, again, uh, my name is Brendan Austin. I'm the director of the financial performance management practice at LPA. Um, actually, I have a finance and accounting background as well as most of my uh, people in my practice do. So we come at the, the tools with a little bit different flair than some of the other practices do, um, more from a business perspective. Um, one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about today is how to expand your planning analytics um, investment beyond just accounting and finance. Um, so we're going to talk about um, specifically an HR and headcount uh, model that we did for Germania Insurance. Um, so a little bit about Germania Insurance. Um, they're a large farm mutual insurance company uh, based out, outside of Houston, Texas in Brenham. Um, they have about 300 employees. Um, they've been uh, in business since 1896. Um, back in 2010, so right at 10 years ago, uh, we first engaged with Germania. Um, they were a previous Cognos Enterprise planning uh, customer, um, and they had a very complicated model that they were using um, to basically take all of the, the financial uh, performance and, and transactions into a model and then allocate it out to different lines of business um, across uh, lines of business based on policy and claim counts, et cetera. So all their accounting expenses, their HR, down to you know, the, the uh, automobile expenses that they have. Um, and so they're basically using that as a, a tool to close the books at the end of the month uh, to allocate properly the expenses to the right business unit. Um, but uh, those cues were just used by the accounting department, but it became a critical application to uh, Germania Insurance. About three months later, um, they came back to us and said, we'd like to use, uh, at the time, T1, uh, to also do uh, planning and budgeting. So we worked with them again um, and created a budget model um, with templates for each department to go in and key in basic budget information kind of standard TM1 planning analytics implementation, right? It's the next iteration to do budgeting forecasting. Um, the big issue that they had with that model at the time, there were certain key line items to those templates, um, mainly for headcount uh, and uh, payroll uh, expense line items. They required a whole lot of back-end calculations on spreadsheets. Um, and typically, each department and spending about three weeks compiling all that data just to enter the data into their budget. So whereas, you know, implementing this system um, and the workflow associated with it did uh, reduce their budget 
timeline um, in total, um, the user was, was still frustrated with the whole budget process. So um, essentially the business problem was the company had, other than one time a year, um, they had no integrated solution um, for all the department managers to see who was in their department as far as you know, an accounting perspective um, and, and how those expenses were hitting their budget. Um, on a yearly basis, the tool was being manually updated by the HR department, and that could take weeks to compile and send back and forth between the departments and, and HR. Um, and so HR was cobbling these Excel spreadsheets together. Uh, a lot of the calculations were inconsistent. Um, some numbers were wrong. They were having to calculate taxes, et cetera. Um, and management had no way to track individual employees against budget during the year. So as a department maybe expanded or they hired more people or they had people leave, they couldn't see how their budget may be impacted or how they're actually doing um, you know, actual two budget on a monthly basis. So we used uh, planning analytics on the cloud. Uh, we, we used the opportunity to actually take them to the cloud um, and actually created an headcount and an HR tracking uh, model. Uh, basically, uh, we integrated all the data from ADP and Paycom, which are their two um, systems that they use to actually track their employees and, and payroll expenses, import all that data into a new model um, and, and created salary uh, by department. We calculated all the employee taxes uh, based upon their withholdings, et cetera. Uh, their 401k contributions based upon uh, their, their yearly um, selections that they did and the contributions that the company was doing. We're also calculating vacation, sick health and life insurance expenses by employee and then rolling those up by department. And you'll see some of the screenshots that we did at the bottom where uh, a department head can actually go in, look at each individual uh, person in his or her department. Of course, it's all security based. So, you know, one department couldn't see another department's uh, employees, et cetera. Um, but they could go in there and actually make changes um, and or updates directly on the screen. It's, you know, uh, allocated automatically. Uh, you know, allocated up and it's sent to accounting essentially automatically and updates their budget. Um, we also use the contributor workflow um, within this too. So each department head can go in and, and select their department, make those changes and submit that for approval um, so that when accounting is kind of bringing that whole budget process together, uh, they know who has actually updated their budget and their headcount uh, changes um, within the model. Um, the other thing that this did is it automatically filled in those three or four line items in their financial budget. Um, so there is no more cobbling together of, of individual data to, to get all this information into the financial budget. Um, essentially, um, by implementing this, uh, Germania said that they, they saved about 300 hours a quarter so when you took out all the departments within the organization, um, including HR and all the, the work that they had to do, automating all of these, uh, these calculations into the model, they did save 300 hours in total every quarter. So that's 1,200 hours a year that they're, they're saving using this tool on a yearly basis. Um, so you know, it's really exciting to use this. Um, uh, because we've implemented this, now it's it's starting to grow outside of the accounting and HR groups, and we're starting to talk to other areas as well, uh, but leveraging you know their investment that they already made 10 years ago in planning analytics. So, um, any questions that have come up on on this section? Don, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, Brendan. Um, let me see. Uh, you 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 zip through very very quickly. Appreciate that. Uh, I do not uh, see any specific questions, but um, let let me ask a question then, uh, Brendan. So, uh, and again, for the for the folks uh, that are participating, you know, planning analytics is is a great tool. It's kind of a, a cousin, a sister, or a cousin to Cognos Analytics, 
do we see many organizations that use both tools uh, and, and why would you use planning analytics when you might have Cognos analytics for reporting? Just kind of really a basic, what are the pros and cons of both and why uh, we, a lot of our clients have both? Sure, uh, yeah, we do actually see a lot of customers that have both uh, tool sets. Um, you know, the, the main use of using, and you can use Cognos Analytics to report off planning analytics data. Um, you can also use planning analytics to report off planning analytics data. Um, the big difference between the two is the read, the read write ability um, of planning analytics. So whether you're doing forecasting, budgeting, what if analysis, um, you can write directly into those uh, those web reports or those Excel reports and change that data and model that data on the fly and see how that in, um, impacts the total um, total results. Um, and so that's why you would use the planning analytics front end to do that, whereas Cognos is read only. Excellent. That, that, that's very helpful. And then uh, your, your um, example today was uh, around uh, using it in human resources department when classically most organizations start in the, in the finance department. But have we seen use of planning analytics in manufacturing uh, as well? We have. In fact, we're starting to get a lot of business uh, using it for demand forecasting um, in manufacturing. Um, so down at the plant level, SKU level, customer level, um, where we can go in and put in a demand forecast for to two years in the, in the future, um, roll that up by SKU, by customer. Um, and then on the flip side of that, do customer profitability based off of that um, analysis, uh, both for actuals and a forecast. Um, so it's, it is bleeding into other areas of the organization. Um, I used to actually own this product um, in industry. I was uh, a customer of IBM uh, way back when um, in the oil and gas industry. And we used it in operations uh, where we actually monitored all the oil and gas wells that we had on a daily basis, uh, the production, and um, did analysis and plotting of that uh, production on a daily basis so that we could identify oil and gas wells that may need additional work um, and also look at the profitability uh, by each one of those oil and gas wells as well. So there are tons of applications that you can apply planning analytics to all the way throughout the organization. Yeah, and, and I'll just throw one last one out, and then uh, we'll hand the ball over to Rich Chester for the next uh, portion of this. And, and one uh, last one would be for organizations that um, are, are highly driven by, you know, personnel fluctuations, right? So in the manufacturing example, clearly in today's environment, um, some industries are seeing, um, you know, a dramatic downturn in their business. Um, requiring you know, furloughing of employees and, and just anticipating costs and doing what if scenarios. Um, at the hospitality industry is an industry we have several clients in that use planning analytics. Uh, you know how many how many room service folks do you need based upon planned occupancy, so forth. Being able to do what if analyses is key. Um, it, you know, and, and unfortunately, those industries are hurting right now. On the flip side, the grocery industry the third party logistics industry, shippers and uh, grocers, they're seeing a dramatic change in the mix of products um, in, in demand that having planning analytics. And we're working with, uh, with both of those industries, third party logistics and grocery industries um, with planning analytics. And it's really helping them do a much better job, uh, as Brennan said, on demand planning and forecasting and understanding profitability by SKU level. Um, so any manufacturer, grocer, third-party logistics provider, it's a great application. So with that, let me, let me um, pass the ball back to Rich Chester. And again, Brendan will be available during our uh, 4 o'clock at 4 o'clock uh, to answer any other questions you have on planning analytics. Um, so that um, please uh, stick around. We, we've got some special uh, items at that point in time. Um, with that, Rich, it uh, looks like you have your cloud pack for data um, section up. And again, this is a, a bite-sized chunk, about 15 minutes of presentation material and five minutes of uh, questions and answers. 
Thank you very much. Yeah. All in your court, Rich. Thank you much. Everybody can hear me okay? I can hear you fine. Perfect. Uh, thanks. Glad to be back. Um, my presentation here on Cloud Pack for Data, this is intended to be a primer. This is a, a high-level overview of a suite of technology you're going to hear more and more about as time goes on. And uh, just as, a, as an FYI, if you are attending the virtual Think conference in May, you're going to hear a lot of announcements, I think, about uh, version three of the Cloud Pack uh, for Data software solution. So, you know, uh, um, a big component of the next few years relative to platforms from IBM is going to be centered around these cloud paths. So my goal in 15 minutes or less is to chat with you a bit about just the concept of a cloud pack. What is it? Let's jump into a little bit of detail about cloud pack for data. Um, some of the, what are the base components? What are some of the applications that are optional and available? Uh, why you might use it versus a traditional deployment method for these products, and then specifically a bit about Cognos Analytics on Cloud Pack for Data. I came up with some questions that people have asked me when I've done this presentation before. I look forward to trying to answer as many of yours as I can. I'll also invite our CTO, David Russell, to uh, open his mic at that time and chime in uh, for any of the questions, and that's the plan. So a cloud pack, what is it? Um, a cloud pack is a, an enterprise ready solution from IBM. It's a collection of middleware, software and services for deployment and management, an integration layer, and a whole bunch of applications that are running uh, in a containerized fashion. So containerized software, development of containerized software solutions is is probably the, if you will, the current standard for how one goes to um, begin the development of a new application. You develop it in containers. Uh, those containers run on a platform, uh, many times on Linux. They are uh, intended to encapsulate a single function. So you create a bunch of microservices, basically, that are in a container. That container includes everything that would be needed to implement that service. You string a lot of these containerized microservices together and you have an application. That kind of platform is what all of the cloud packs are baked on. Specifically the platform on which the cloud packs from IBM run is on Red Hat OpenShift. So cloud packs, collection of containerized software solutions from IBM, fast way to deploy, a secure way to deploy, core business applications on any cloud, using servers that run Red Hat OpenShift. If Red Hat OpenShift is supported on that platform, you can deploy Cloud Packs on that platform. Now, keep in mind that going along with Cloud Packs is this notion of clouds. That's why they're called Cloud Packs after all. Um, IBM defines um, various and sundry different clouds, uh, clouds that you um, run yourself, a so-called private cloud. That could be your own hardware. That could be um, an IBM supplied private cloud. It could be from Amazon. It could be from Microsoft. You've got public cloud, right? You've also got your on-premise software and solutions that really you want to manage in one place. You really want to have one cockpit to manage all of those solutions. It's actually OpenShift that can give us that one cockpit and run across what IBM terms the hybrid cloud, which is the platform for computing um, of the future. So we're all gonna be in this world of on-premise, uh, private cloud and public cloud solutions that cross, and, and we wanna be able to manage them all in one place. We wanna be able to migrate items from one cloud type to another cloud type seamlessly and easily. And OpenShift is the platform on which IBM is betting we're all going to standardize uh, to manage our hybrid cloud. And on top of that OpenShift platform, thus running in any cloud solution you care to, you can run cloud packs, these selection of applications. And there's a bunch of them. There's cloud pack for applications, for data and integration, and so on. 
So this slide kind of shows any cloud on the bottom, consider that your hybrid, hybrid cloud box, any uh, of those clouds that can support OpenShift, and OpenShift runs on many, many platforms, not, uh, um, not just Red Hat Linux, right? Um, OpenShift runs across that cloud. It gives you that, that single point of integration across, in the case of this presentation, all of the different cloud packs that IBM is bringing to offer. Remember, the cloud pack is a collection of applications and services that allow those applications to integrate. Right, to serve a particular purpose, to focus on a particular set of functions. Cloud Pack for Data is one of those cloud packs that focuses at, on all of the infrastructure and available applications in the world of data and augmented intelligence. So this is a collection of applications to allow you to collect, organize, and analyze data. Um, it, integrates with lots of AI technology, with data management products from IBM, with government products from IBM, and with certain well-known to this group business analytics technologies like Cognos Analytics um, in this containerized hybrid cloud managed on OpenShift platform. Um, and truly, once you have the, the Cloud Pack infrastructure installed deploying these applications and stringing them together to develop new applications can happen in hours as opposed to days and weeks and months. So that's Cloud Pack for data. That's the Cloud Pack focused on data and AI. So what comes with this tool? And this is pre-announcement in Think. So this list um, may change at Think when they announce the next version. Um, but also the components that are listed here will also be enhanced um, as part of that announcement. So on the left-hand side, when you buy Cloud Pack for Data out of the box, right, for your license uh, 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 payment, you get this collection of integrated and available features and functions. So I'll just read through the list yourself. I'll just highlight a few, like DB2 Warehouse, right, that's an AI-ready data warehouse for cloud. Um, you know, DB2 Event Store, that's an in-memory database for massive data volumes and real-time analytics, right? Um, Streams is about ingesting, um, you know, thousands of real-time sources. Uh, you know, uh, Bots and Studio, right? That's a, a development train and manage AI models tool, right? So you can create your models and then deploy for your AI-powered applications from there. Um, lots of good stuff. From a, I buy CP for D, I get this as the collection of tools in my platform. That's the left hand side. Now, the right hand side is a collection of additional tools that run on the same infrastructure that you could optionally include when you get CP for D. So you can get full on DB2, for example. You can get Cognos Analytics. This is the full on Cognos Analytics software. On the left hand side, I meant to point this out, so I'm going to scooch you to the bottom of the left of this slide. Notice Cognos dashboards come out of the box in the Cloud Pack for Data platform. So the very same dashboard technology that you see when you log into your on premise Cognos Analytics environment and launch new dashboards or open a dashboard, that component of Cognos Analytics is baked into Cloud Pack for Data out of the box. If you wish, you could add on the full bore, the end-to-end -end Cognos Analytics reporting um, dashboards, explorations, data modules, and all of the rest of the components that are part of your Cognos Analytics world um, as a cartridge. Planning Analytics, I know, is coming soon. That will be part of this uh, announcement and think almost for certain. Um, and there's a, a bunch of other interesting cartridges that, that run on the same platform uh, can leverage many of the base components, right, that are integrated with those components. Um, and that integration is ongoing, and more and more integration comes as they release every new version of Cloud Pack. Um, and Cognos Analytics be, is one of them. Now, you knew since I was presenting this, Cognos Analytics had to be involved in some way.
Now, why would you go with Cloud Pack versus just buy those products and integrate them yourself? Well, the notion of data virtualization is baked into the Cloud Pack for data world. In other words, there is a way for you to define your data once and access it through many solutions. And not only access it, right, access them with governance, with security, and full scalability. It's actually, according to IBM lab tests anyway, 40 times faster than using a federated data solution is using the data virtualization that comes out of Cloud Pack for Data. I mentioned governance already. You can't overstate data governance. Data privacy by design, right? The whole Cloud Pack for Data solution is, is built around the notion of you being able to make data private and have it be based on policies and rules, auditable so that it can manage your regulatory compliance for um, FISMA and uh, 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 um, HIPAA and other kinds of regulatory components. Again, unmatched by competitor products. You can tell I borrowed this slide from IBM because you've got the unmatched on the bottom there. But data governance is in from the get-go. It's not an afterthought. It's not something they tried to top, put on the top after the fact. It's there as a fundamental. Um, operationalizing your AI, your augmented intelligence. So, you know, a lot of us maybe are not yet deploying AI into our base applications, into the applications that we are using day to day or that we're developing uh, potentially, right, internally. However, that is the wave of the future. I think we all, all probably know and accept that. This platform gives you the means um, to, to in a trusted and transparent way, model and then um, roll out and govern the life cycle of your AI models into your uh, AI application, your AI enabled applications. And then finally, it's based on OpenShift, right? So you can deploy it on the hybrid cloud, your cloud, their cloud, internal servers, whatever makes sense for you or a mix thereof, which is the most powerful in ours. Um, open source AI tools and runtimes, it's enterprise class, high availability software, and it gives you that one pane, that one cockpit for system management across your hybrid cloud. That's why Cloud Pack is so exciting and valuable. Cognos Analytics on Cloud Pack, it's known as a cartridge. Cartridges are always things that come uh, a la carte, things that you choose to purchase in addition to the base platform. So the CA cartridge is one of those things, and it is a full set of features, as I said. It's reporting, dashboard, storytelling, explorations. It does support only the dynamic query mode. So you're not going to be able to access SQL Server 2008, right, because that's no longer a supported data source through JDBC. Um, you, you might still be accessing it on your on-premise, right, because you can load native drivers, right? Native drivers are not going to um, be supported in the, uh, the Cognos Analytics cartridge environment. Uh, but you can model with Framework Manager if you wish. It's still supported. It's still a client tool, right? So you install it on your Windows desktop just like normal, and you configure it to integrate with Cognos Analytics running on your Cloud Pack for Data platform. Um, and so that would work essentially as is. Again, you're modeling in the dynamic query mode. Also, data modules are part of the full set of features in Cognos Analytics. So, you know, we've been getting a lot of questions earlier today about, you know, what's the difference between data modules and framework manager? Should I be migrating from framework manager to data modules? Um, you know, in the short term, for most folks, the answer to that is something along these lines. New modeling tasks, you should probably be using data modules for. Do you want to launch an immediate convert all my framework models to data modules? Because I, you know, probably not. If you're going to make large changes to your framework models, you should give it some thought. Is now the time to migrate? You know, eventually, right, there, there could come a time where framework manager is not supported. That time is not now. Um, there is no announced end of life for Framework Manager. And as you can see, even in the latest and greatest platform and deployment option, Cloud Pack for Data with the CA cartridge, 
framework manager is still an integral part of that. So I'd be more apt to tell you that you should begin your transformation from compatible query mode to dynamic query mode and get out of the world of native drivers for accessing data. That I would highly recommend. Um, but in terms of which modeling tool you're using, data modules for new stuff, FM is perfectly fine to maintain what you have, but as you find you're doing a lot of maintenance, maybe now's the time to move. Another thing that's part of the CA cartridge, the content store for DB is going to be DB2 for that cartridge. So DB2, if you will, comes with it. Uh, not a lot of people may not know this, but your on-premise license for Cognos Analytics happens to include a version of DB2 as an option for your content store. In Cloud Pack for Data, it will be your content store data. So that is that is one of the one of the rules with the CA cartridge. Um, and you're going to use the Cloud Pack for Data authentication service, which is one of these open ID-based services. Um, it is not going to integrate with your Active Directory. Um, you can, still, you can still manage your users and your groups uh, through the interface. And by the way, these Cloud Pack for Data users are also able to be authorized uh, and authenticated within all of the other components on your Cloud Pack platform, right? And that, so it's a fully integrated uh, security model in Cloud Pack for Data that Cognos will leverage in the cartridge. So that's kind of your big overview, right, of the Cognos Analytics cartridge and your big overview of what is Cloud Pack for Data. You're going to hear it. We kind of wanted you to have the, the definition in your head. Some questions that I'm asked a lot um, at this point in this presentation, is this really full-on Cognos Analytics? Yeah, it is. Uh, but as you heard a little bit on the previous slide, there are some technical limitations, no native drivers. Um, you, you're going to use open uh, the, uh, uh, the Cloud Pack for Data Authentication Service and that kind of thing. Um, in addition, you will not get Query Studio. You will not get Analysis Studio. Uh, at the moment, anyway, Dynamic Cubes are not supported. Um, the roadmap does include adding the legacy tools uh, like Query and Analysis Studio, uh, as well as Transformer to the product. Um, no one will share timing with me from IBM. You can't hardly blame them. Uh, right, that's a forbidden thing within IBM, right? Those forward-looking statements are a, a touchy thing. Um, so they can, they can express that they're on the roadmap, they just can't give us a specific date. Uh, but it's good to know that those things will come. So for those of us who have not yet migrated off of um, things like Query Studio or Analysis Studio, it's good to know that they'll be an option eventually. From a licensing perspective, um, licenses come in two flavors for the CA Cartridge. So let's be clear, the Cloud Pack for Data base product is licensed based on something called a VPC, a virtual processing unit, basically. That is about the, the power of the servers across which you could deploy CP4D. So that hybrid, ser hybrid cloud server farm, you, you buy a certain amount of power for that, um, and that's the maximum power you can deploy across. Um, you could then add the CA cartridge on at a, in this notion of a power capacity um, VPC. If you're a PBU licensed on-premise user, a processor value unit, very, very similar in concept. You're buying an amount of power and the number of users is, is as much as the power can handle. So you could go that way. So CP for D, you buy the VPCs. Add in the Cognos Analytics cartridge. Maybe you add more VPCs. Or you can purchase it using a named user approach, a lot like many of us have purchased our on-premise software. So you have a couple of options there. If I use just dashboards, do I need the CA cartridge? No. The dashboard component is indeed part of the base product. So you get a little bit of Cognos Analytics in every box that contains Cloud Pack for Data. It's if you want the remainder of the functionality that you would license the container. Um, and is there a migration program? I'm often asked about this. So I could migrate um, in the fullness of time when it's right for me, right? All those, you know, good qualifiers. Can I migrate from uh, my on-premise uh, to Cloud Pack for Data uh, with the CA cartridge? And the answer is yes, there are absolutely programs there. Um, I know that uh, my sales guys are very excited about the notion of um, bridging you from 
the on-premise to the, the cloud pack for data. There's programs that would actually give you dual entitlements where you would actually have entitlements to both and you could slowly and uh, you know, uh, thoughtfully migrate your on-premise functionality to the cloud pack for data functionality. So you would actually be able to, to have both available to you and then migrate as it makes sense. So many, many programs that would help you move when the time is right for you to move. And so that's my presentation. My goal was to give you a primer, a set of definitions, help you understand what cloud packs and cloud pack for data is, and also a bit of information about the Cognos Analytics connector. Don, at this point, I'm good for questions, or if there are no questions, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just good. Well, you are good, Rich. Thank you very much for that uh, primer. And I think you, you, you hit all the frequently asked questions right here on the last uh, slide. So you, you kind of anticipated questions and, and took care of them. And uh, we're almost directly on track. Um, uh, we're within uh, two or three minutes of being right on schedule. So I'm very excited about that. Um, I'm going to hand the ball to David Ruffel um, and then uh, while I'm handing it to David and he's getting set up as the presenter here, I do want to remind everybody that uh, please uh, stay for David's presentation here um, because his um, topic, I, no matter what your, um, your, your background is, your function is, I think you're going to want to uh, see this. And then uh, when David finishes, um, we, we got a few minutes that I think you'll enjoy uh, as well on answering questions and sharing polling. Um, so with that, David, um, take it away. Thanks, Don. So uh, I can hear you. Uh, my name is David Russell. Am I unmuted, Don? You are, David. Okay, thanks, Rich. Okay, so uh, this is David Russell. I'm the Chief Technology Officer at LPA, uh, and you know today I wanted to talk a little bit about AI in general. You know, Rich used the term augmented intelligence in there, which is uh, one of the alternate definitions of AI when we start talking about it. You know, and you hear about AI all over the place. Uh, you hear it from you know, on the TV uh, during different events, do you see commercials about it? Um, and, you know, I really want to talk about a couple of different solutions that IBM has that, you know, don't really really fit in with a lot of the tools that we've talked about from an analytics perspective, um, but they are applications that, I, that uh, IBM has provided. They're really solutions built around AI specifically that really are targeted at specific business solutions and using AI in a way that doesn't necessarily require you to do the uh, experimentation and exploration in order to apply AI to your specific problem, or at least not as at the level that you would starting with sort of the general and generic AI solution. So when we talk about AI, you know, uh, what are we really talking about? We're really discussing, you know, the area of computer science where we're um, trying to develop systems that allow machines to behave intelligently or more like humans, uh, where we're not necessarily programming them to answer the questions explicitly uh, that we're dealing with, but we're more allowing them to learn from the data that we have. Uh, it's not a new concept. Uh, you know, there's, since computers were first developed, there have been people predicting when computers would think and when computers would outpace humans as far as intelligence is concerned. Um, and, you know, with that, you've seen an ebb and flow in development and research around AI uh, throughout the history of computing. Uh, and that, you know, ebb and flow has all been about uh, overreaching expectations at the time, uh, has caused people to, you know, succeed and fail uh, in their research and development. And as that has happened, you'll see an ebb and flow in the prominence of AI. Uh, today, we're seeing a resurgence, and a lot of that is led by the data explosion that we see in business today, the amount of computing power, the flexibility, the scalability of computing today that we have, 
And some of these developments of new techniques and new uh, capabilities, really, you know, deep learning being the one that we mention here specifically, and that's really around the, you know, based on the computing power that's available and the ability uh, to allow the computer to operate on large amounts of data uh, very quickly. Um, you know, in most cases today, our goal isn't to, to develop, I'll say, general purpose artificial intelligence. I mean, there's certainly people that are exploring that area, uh, but in most cases, we're really applying AI towards very specific business problems. And, you know, as Rich used the term augmented intelligence, it's really about finding tools to make your job easier, to solve the problems that are repetitive, that you can allow the computer to learn how to solve those problems and learn how to deal with those issues so that you don't necessarily have to deal with them. In many cases, there are solutions and to problems that you may still have a human in the loop um, in the final decision making, but allowing the, the, the system to be trained uh, to deal with things that it can deal with and, and for the system as well as the operator to know when the AI or the system, the, the uh, learning or the machine learning and machine intelligence shouldn't necessarily deal with a particular problem and know, knowing when those differences are. So as we move forward, we're going to look at two different options for these purpose-built solutions um, that build AI directly into the solution and provide an infrastructure that allow you, you to apply AI directly in specific areas. So first, we're going to start with visual inspection. Uh, we're going to talk about a product from IBM called Visual Inspector and Visual Insights uh, that work together to allow you to do uh, analysis uh, of imagery, to do visual inspection, usually in a, a manufacturing environment, but it could be anywhere where you have something that you need to uh, to visually inspect to make sure that it uh, meets the quality or meets your expectations for that. So visual inspector, and sort of to highlight the difference between visual inspector and visual insight, as I talk about visual inspector is a standalone iOS application uh, that works with visual insights. Um, the app can is used with the camera on the iOS device to capture imagery and to execute inference models so that you can do uh, run a model to identify objects or to classify uh, a scene from that imagery. And that uh, model can be run either locally on the iOS device using uh, Apple's Core ML capability, uh, or it can be run uh, remotely on an inference server where the image from the iOS device is captured, sent back to the server, the inference is done there, and you send the results. You know, I, I keep using inference, that's where you're running the model against the image to actually identify uh, either an object in the scene or to classify the object as a whole or the scene as a whole. Um, out of the box, the visual inspector application on the phone can be configured in minutes. Uh, and But if you want to develop, develop production models, that requires the visual insights tool. Uh, on this slide, sort of at the top right, you can see the idea of there's a server in the back end that I talk about that's the Visual Insight server. Uh, that's the server where you actually can build and train the models that can then be deployed out to the Visual Inspector uh, tool. Uh, Visual Insights and Visual Inspector have been developed uh, primarily around the automotive industry is where IBM has had a lot of success with it and they've been uh, developing the capabilities to to meet the needs that they're seeing in the manufacture on the manufacturing lines, you know, and they've you know you see across the bottom a number of different things. You know, one example is you know the white parts on the right car. If they have a single line that uh, is producing two different models, you know, trim levels of the same vehicle, for example, they've got uh, a case where they have they're using the camera to identify if the correct lug nuts are put on the correct vehicle. The higher trim level may have a different lug nut than the lower trim level, and the person on the line has two buckets of lug nuts in front of them. If they put the wrong one on there, somebody has to watch to make sure that that you know, high-end vehicle doesn't end up rolling off the line with the low-end lug nuts or vice versa. And so if you can have this application do that for you, 
uh, you have you know an ability to flag the problem and make sure that it gets fixed before you continue in that process. And you can see that in many different areas and many different manufacturing operations, different ways of doing visual inspection with this type of imagery. You know, in this case, you know, this slide, we're talking about a door inspection example. So the idea is there's certain connectors that have to be plugged in in the electrical harness, uh, being able to take imagery and uh, produce a, a model using, you know, AI and deep learning techniques to identify those cases where the electrical harness isn't plugged in correctly and flag that part for uh, remediation, if you will. Again, similar sort, sort of situation. You know, the idea is you want to be able to improve your inspection capability. You know, by having the iOS device as your endpoint, you have a built-in, you know, tool that, you know, you can go as low as, you know, the $200 version of the iPod Touch has the camera, the wireless connectivity, and processing capability all built into it. You can deploy that quickly as a unit uh, on the floor and do your analysis on the fly uh, with that tool. So one of the things that I did uh, a couple weeks ago uh, was to uh, borrow my son's uh, Lego set. Uh, he had a, a Lego robotic set from 10 or 15 years ago. And uh, we pulled that out of his closet and uh, we built an assembly line uh, from that set. And the idea was to explore using Visual Inspector on this uh, iPhone uh, that's there to uh, look at Legos as they pass down on the um, assembly line and to then uh, flag a defect. In this case, a defective Lego is one that's upside down on the assembly line, just to keep things simple for me. Uh, and so I didn't have to actually really destroy any Legos. Um, and so the idea was we built the assembly line. We, you know, I wrote some code to automate the assembly line to move the Legos forward. Uh, when you place the Legos on the assembly line, I then, once we had all that set up, we then actually um, used the iPhone app. Uh, part one of its functions is to capture imagery. Uh, and so we used that with the whole automated system to capture imagery as the Legos went down the assembly line of both the Legos that were placed correctly on the line and Legos that were placed upside down on the line. And then those were pulled back into Visual Insights uh, on the server and you have this web interface that's available to you to then build the model. And so I had this, you know, data set of, you know, 23 uh, sample images that we took of different Legos that were both you know, normally placed and upside down, and then drew boxes around the Legos themselves uh, to identify the Legos that were properly placed and the Legos that were considered defects that are upside down. Um, and then after I drew those boxes, it was just a matter of clicking a button to tell the system to train the model. It then took those images that I had taken and trained a model to then identify Legos that were not defective and Legos that were defective, if you will. Uh, the model ended up being very accurate. Uh, the data scientist in me gets very concerned when he sees 99% accuracy because that usually means overfitting, but uh, I'm pretty comfortable with this. In this particular case, you get some pretty highly accurate models uh, out of this particular technique, uh, and particularly uh, given the relatively small number of images we're dealing with, there are a lot of caveats there. But, it, you know, very good model and uh, very accurate for what we're doing. So then I have a video. We'll see how well it translates over WebEx uh, to show you this in action. But the idea is that the Legos will move down the line and we will see the um, camera on the phone will activate when the Lego is, front, is in front of the camera. Uh, it'll take a picture. You'll see on the you know, iPhone there, you'll see the pictures get taken. Uh, some of the times you'll see it actually draw the inferred, the box around the Lego indicating what is identified. There's some timing problems in the demo. You don't always see the blue box get drawn um, but it is going to correctly identify the yellow, the blue, the green block as being a defect. The yellow block there was identified correctly, even though it's in a different orientation. 
But once the green block is identified as a defect, you'll see that we actually, the iPhone sends a signal and it triggers another motor to kick that brick off the line because it's defective and we don't want it there. And that's really to highlight the fact that you know, the iPhone has the ability to, through the network, send a signal that you, through a queue to whatever uh, system you have in place to uh, take action uh, when a defect is identified. And that action could be as simple as lighting a light uh, or as complex as actually doing something with the line, uh, if that's a capability. Um, we see that uh, in other cases, we have visual inspection examples. Uh, we have real world examples of other cases. So one of the things that I should highlight with that, that I didn't mention that I usually do, uh, you know, it took the, you know, a day and a half to build the Lego uh, assembly line. Uh, it really only took about a half hour to do the whole uh, training of the model uh, and the model development. My headset just died, so hopefully you're able to hear me now as I've switched to speakerphone. We can, David. Yes, we can hear you, David. We can hear you. Okay, good. Um, so in, the, um, in these real-world examples, you see similar time frames for developing these models. Um, you know, we see that in the uh, wiring harness on the door, we took about 80 minutes to develop the model from taking the pictures and actually training the model, you know, to looking at welds in the vehicle, you know, about 45 minutes in a real world example, you know, under the hood cases doing about a 60 minute um, for developing that model, about 30 minutes for that wheel uh, bolts example that I described. So. Visual inspection, we've gotten past that. So now we're gonna switch gears to something very different. Um, and this is Watson Assistant. And Watson Assistant is uh, IBM's product for developing virtual assistants. And the virtual assistant is, uh, well, uh, I'll use the uh, other you know, names. It's you know, any of the systems that you can you know, verbally ask questions and have them respond to you. Uh, as and Watson Assistant is designed around you know the chat system where you can type in a, a, a question into a system and have it respond to you. Very similar to the Cognos Assistant that's in there. Watson Assistant is a tool for developing those. Uh, AI comes into Watson Assistant through the uh, ability to take natural language processing and identify the intent of the user based on their request without having to build this big rules engine to look at the words that they type in and to identify exactly what they meant based on keywords or you know, building some sort of decision tree where you have to anticipate every way they might ask them, ask a particular question. The idea is with Watson Assistant, you define intents, which are the things that you want um, the system to be able to respond to. You give it examples of what those intents are and then it uses artificial intelligence and natural language processing to expand that net so that as additional questions are asked in different forms, it interprets which intent that individual had based on uh, the AI's knowledge of uh, language and being able to process that. So it really gives you an ability to do conversational AI systems, you know, gives you a single path. You can integrate it with a number of different uh, input channels. You know, I mentioned chat. I talked about, you know, I mentioned sort of voice. Uh, it has the ability to use speech to text and text to speech to convert, you know, voice communications to text that can be processed by Watson Assistant and then respond uh, through um, this, the text to speech capability. Uh, and all of that gives you the ability to manage the dialogue and manage the way uh, the system responds to users by once the intent is identified, providing some response and some appropriate response that might be static information that you provide. It might be collecting additional information for effectively the assistant to 
um, call into a back-end system to perform an action. So you might be able to use Watson Assistant, or you can use Watson Assistant to schedule appointments and things like that by having the assistant have a dialogue with the end user to collect the information necessarily, necessary and then call into a back-end system to actually perform an action. Um, it really strengthens your customer service capability, uh, or one of the ways you can use the assistant is through customer service. Um, certainly lowers costs and reduced risk. It's all about using a centralized application to use AI to understand intents and respond to users and do that consistently across those different channels. One thing today, that, uh, you know, with the customer service and things that people need to answer questions, you see, you know, you could ask the question in these different ways and provide a response. You know, IBM has been focused on using Watson Assistant uh, currently to help uh, different entities uh, respond to the current COVID-19 crisis. Um, they have, you know, used the model in a number of our cases. We've got a few examples here. Uh, where organizations are needing to respond to questions. There are a lot of people concerned about, you know, getting answers to questions uh, about the disease, you know, everything from, you know, questions to medical centers around, you know, what are symptoms and how do I know if I have it and what are the right ways to disinfect to schools needing to respond to questions about closures and when things are going to get back to normal. Uh, or, you know, what the current status is to, you know, public, you know, governments being able to respond to questions about, you know, what are the restrictions associated with it and what, you know, what should they be doing. As part of that, uh, IBM has a program with Watson Assistant for Citizens uh, where you can apply to IBM to have free access for Watson Assistant for a limited time for COVID-19 specific use cases. Uh, with that program, you have unlimited access to Watson Assistant with voice integration, Watson Discovery, and Watson Content Catalog, with our, which are complementary tools that help to provide consistent, useful information. Um, you get access to 15 pre-trained COVID-19 intents in English and Spanish. So the idea is that they have already, they have these 15 different cases where they've already come up with questions that people may have. Many of them were examples that I just used um, that you can start with to give you a starting point. And they provide you access to a lot of self-paced and instructor-led education as part of this package um, and additional support for rolling this out and so that you can you know, expand it out and provide the responses. Because one of the real keys to this is you know, providing the correct and accurate information to respond to the questions that are asked by the by citizens that do have questions. And so Watson Assistant, one of the keys to it is it has an interface that allows you to go and look at the intents and the questions that people might ask and be able to update that information easily and quickly through this uh, cloud interface and a web interface that you have uh, to Watson Assistant. Um, and that's one of the things that's very important is being able to up those, uh, update those answers and make them relevant and timely because things are changing uh, all the time as people are dealing with this and we want to keep people up to date with the best information. So it's an interesting program for both of these things. You know, if, you, if you've got interest, you know, certainly get in touch with us and let us know how we can uh, assist you uh, with either of these and we can uh, talk more about how they can be helpful to you. So Don, that frees things up for me and uh, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Great. Uh, thank you, David. Um, let me let me ask you this question. Um, you used the manufacturing example, um, like the automotive lines, but can this be used outside of manufacturing? Like, what other use cases are there? So it can be used outside of manufacturing. Um, you know, it's it's. You, as you get outside of manufacturing, you have a less controlled environment in many cases for the imagery that you're using. So, you know, the, the use cases take a little bit more development in those cases, but it can be applied. You know, we see, uh, we've seen examples of using it, everything from, you know, retail with stocking for doing, uh, for identifying where there might be stockouts using a camera that, you know, sees the, um, the, 
shelves at the store and being able to identify where there are gaps and holes. Uh, we've seen that example. Uh, you've, they've also tested examples of using it um, in urban environments for different image detection. Uh, it's not the facial detection side of things, but it's the object detection in, in uh, public spaces. Uh, certain object detection uh, and could be applied to a number of different you know, use cases in those sorts of areas. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, great examples. And I know uh, LPA, you know, as a partner working with IBM on this, um, we're getting started working uh, with a, one of the major auto manufacturers. So, um, you know, it's a very exciting new uh, application. Uh, one question on the Watson Assistant, David, how is Watson Assistant different from an IVR or traditional call management system? And, and while so you're real, answering that, David, I'm going to pull the, I'm going to grab your screen, but go ahead and answer that question. Sure. sure. So uh, the real difference uh, with the IVR versus Watson Assistant is Watson Assistant allows the end user to have a better experience by Watson Assistant understanding their intent more quickly. So the way an IVR traditionally would understand the intent of a user is it would ask a series of questions, you know, and you, that everybody's experienced the frustration of the deep tree of questions, you know, press one for this, press four for that, press five for that, and you get down three or four levels and you realize you're not in the right place and you have to come back up and restart and it, it can be very frustrating for people. Um, and so the IVR intent determines intent by asking them multiple questions. Uh, Watson Assistant determines intent by interpreting what you asked, right? So that you can ask it a question at the beginning and interprets intent. It, has, it does have the ability to disambiguate and to ask additional questions and follow up in case it doesn't understand your initial response. Um, but you know, the, the whole idea is to get to that intent faster and make the end user's experience uh, more seamless, and, and that's really the big difference between IVR and uh, traditional IVR and Watson Assistant. David, thank you very much. 